Okay, I guess we can start. Well, people are very distributed right now, very sparse. Hopefully you can, you can still hear. Are the lights okay? You won't fall asleep with these? Okay, that's good. So we're going to cover another really exciting topic. I mean, there's no topic that's not exciting in this class, hopefully. But this is something also very fundamental. Uh, we get to it right now just because of the way things are ordered. But we're going to talk about hopefully all of these today. If we talk about all of these, that'll give you a full picture of what a multiprocessor design is about today. Although we, we really touched on a lot of aspects of multiprocessors so far, this lecture kind of brings them together and formalizes some of the concepts. And hopefully we'll, fi we'll have fun with some problems also. Okay, just a summary of what you uh, learned last week. We talked about memory latency tolerance and prefetching. These won't be on the exam next week, as you know, but you should know them. They're fun. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about multiprocessors, memory consistency, and cache coherence. And tomorrow is supposed to be a review session, but at the end of the lecture, we can discuss what's going to be covered. Okay, uh, we're going to jump to this. There are a bunch of readings uh, that I recommend that you do. M. Dahl's seminal paper is a required reading. It's only three pages. I think everybody who is getting a computer science education should read that paper in this day and age. So hopefully you'll have fun with it. It's a very easy to read. And there are a bunch of recommended readings. These, are, uh, these two are relatively overview readings. They're a bit old and outdated, but they, they still apply, I think. Okay, and memory consistency. This is Lamport's seminal paper on sequential consistency. That's also two pages only. And again, you'll have fun with it. And cache coherence, and this is uh, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is the Illinois Protocol, which is the MESI Protocol paper that was proposed in 1984. And if you are really interested in learning more about cache coherence, these are some old, uh, old chapters, but they cover some of the basics. Well, I think lecture notes are really the basics, but <laughs> if you want to learn more, you can read these. Okay. Before I move on, I will uh, encourage you to attend two distinguished lectures that are coming up. I'll talk about one of them today. Uh, but uh, the, these distinguished lectures, or distinguished colloquia, as they're called here, uh, they're very good opportunities to learn about state of the art in many different topics. And two of them that are upcoming are very relevant to what we're covering in this course. This is more at the software level. Uh, Michael Scott, uh, who has done a lot of work on memory synchronization and multiprocessors, will actually touch upon that very little today, uh, is going to come on December 4th. Uh, it's at CAPG61 at the regular time for these distinguished lectures. And he's going to talk about data structures for persistent memory. Does this sound interesting? Hopefully, you guys are all time. This is a really good opportunity, I think, because these are special invited speakers that come and that give a talk so that you can learn about cutting edge research that they're doing uh, at that point in time. And this topic, I'll very briefly derail the lecture to talk about what this topic is about because I think it's really important. As you can see over here, we've, we've covered emerging memory technologies, right? Non-volatile memory. Uh, they, they, they're byte decibel memory technologies and they enable the opportunity to directly manipulate data, persistent data inside memory through the programming language. So you don't need to go through the file system, if you remember that lecture where I talked about it. You can actually get significant benefit by directly manipulating an array uh, in memory in a persistent manner. And that's good because that way you get rid of a lot of the software overheads to actually do the file open and underneath the memory, uh, underneath the, uh, memory system or the operating system actually copies the file to memory such that you, you can manipulate it and then copies it back to the disk. You get rid of all of that overhead. Now, the problem is it opens up some issues also. For example, special care must be taken to assure that the values in memory will be mutually consistent in the wake of a crash, given that cache is right values back in arbitrary order. So what, hap what happens if you have manipulated some data in a linked list, for example, and your system crashes, and this data was persistent in memory? So that's actually a real problem if you, if you actually expose persistence directly to the programming language. Now you, you have to deal with this issue. And he's going to talk about uh, his solutions to this issue. And I think this is really important to enable something like uh, non-volatile memory directly accessible to the programmer. Uh, 
And I'll give you a very brief overview of this. This is a topic, actually, my research group has been working on for a while as well. Uh, I think Michael Scott is looking at it from the more software side, and we've been looking at it from the more hardware-software cooperative side. But I think in the end, the solution will be uh, to both together. But what is the problem? Basically, you have a persistent memory that you directly store into. Let's say you store into a persistent array, you update it, or a persistent linked list, but you get a system crash. This could be a program crash, this could be a hardware failure, it could be any type of crash. Uh, and now you have a problem. Your data may be corrupted because you've already up updated some part of your data structure, but other parts may not be updated. So your pointers may be inconsistent, for example. Let's see how this might happen. For example, you're trying to add an O to a linked list. You first link to the next, and then you link to the previous. But while you're doing this, some, something happens, and you get inconsistent linked list. And you're, when you restart your system, your program will crash again because your pointers are not connected well. And you can imagine many, many errors happening here, right? So this should not happen clearly, and the programmer should not have to reason about it, otherwise they will go crazy. This lecture is going to be all about programming, actually, later when we talk about multiprocessors also. So how do you actually ensure that you don't get into this inconsistent memory state? Basically, this is a key question. How do you ensure? This is called crash consistency. This is called the crash consistency problem. It's very well known, actually, in storage systems because a similar issue exists in storage systems. But storage systems, it's easier to handle because the latencies are very large, right? You're writing to an SSD. You're writing to a hard disk. And a storage system needs to guarantee that whenever you crash, for example, when you, uh, when you take out your USB, for example, uh, while you're writing data to it, your USB needs to be in a consistent state, right? That's essentially a file system. You don't want to see an inconsistent state, and sometimes you do, actually, because your USB driver is terrible, probably. That happens, but that's exactly the same problem here. You take out your USB, and you get an inconsistent file. But it's much worse over here because your memory can be corrupt completely. Okay, so there are two extremes, as usual. You can do everything in software and everything in hardware. One is programmer transparent, let the system handle it. System give the illusion of consistency without the programmer dealing with it. Or the other is let the programmer handle it and go crazy while the system designer does nothing. Right. And clearly there are many alternatives in between, and in between alternatives are the most interesting ones, I think. So what has other works done? I believe Michael Scott will talk about some approaches that look like this. So some, some solutions are basically if you're writing to persistent memory, you write it in terms of transactions. We haven't talked about transactions. We may talk about it later on. But a transaction it, it, it guarantees atomic execution like this. Basically, it's an atomic piece of code. It, uh, you update the linked list, for example, over here, insert a new node, and either all of this code is executed or none of it is executed. And somebody guarantees that. Let's assume the system guarantees that. Software can guarantee it or hardware can guarantee it. Now, if this happens, that's good. But now the problem is the programmer needs to write the code such that they insert these transaction boundaries or atomic execution boundaries. And this could potentially limit the adoption of non-volatile memory because now you have to rewrite the code with clear partition between volatile and non-volatile data. Does that make sense? So somebody guarantees that this code is either completely executed or not executed at all, regardless of what happens to the system, regardless of a system crash. For example, if the system crashes in the middle of it, here, over here, the system gives the illusion that, oh, you haven't even started this atomic code block. And you could do this in software, you could do this in hardware. There are many, many proposals for it, which we're not going to go into unless we cover transactional memory. So the downside of this is somebody needs to rewrite the code. Now you can say, you can always say the code, whenever you start the program, atomic begin, and when you end the program, atomic end. So the entire program is transactional. That works clearly, but that may be terrible, right? That actually has a lot of issues. Now the program may need to be executing alone. But it may actually lead to starvation problems, right? What if you keep getting a system crash? You may never progress. So this is actually tough, so it puts burden on the programmers. And also, it's, a, it's always a good, to, a good thing to think about what happens with legacy code, right? How do you make legacy code work? There's a lot of code written, assuming that you're operating on volatile structures, volatile data. And if system crashes while you're actually writing to a persistent piece of memory, non-volatile memory, how do you actually make sure this works? There are a lot of open questions here, so I'm not going to answer all of these. 
But I'll give you an example of uh, one of the works very, very briefly that has come out of my group. Uh, I think this is the other extreme, if you will. The programmer does nothing. I don't think the solution is really that either extreme. The solution is somewhere in between, but it's always good to explore the extremes. Basically, uh, provide software transparent crash consistency. And the idea here is uh, relatively simple, actually, if you think about it. You periodically checkpoint the entire state that you have in the system. And some systems actually do that uh, for fault tolerance reasons. Uh, you checkpoint the state, and then you run for a while, and then you take another checkpoint. Now, if your system crashes in between, you go back to the previous checkpoint. That's the basic idea. How do you do that? Then you have to read the paper for details. Because if you want to actually make this work, it really needs to be efficient. For it to be efficient, you need to consider different granularities. You cannot checkpoint, for example, at a page granularity. That's a lot of state. Uh, and you need to overlap checkpointing at execution. You cannot say, I execute for a while, and then I spend time for checkpointing. That's a big no-no, because that checkpointing takes a long time. And if you look at uh, systems that try to provide fault tolerance. So if you think about a fault in a system, it's relatively similar. You're, you're running this huge simulation in your supercomputing cluster. You get a fault. And that fault actually affects all, uh, most of your computation. If you're checkpointing at regular intervals, you can go back to the previous checkpoint. Right? And that previous checkpoint enables you to redo the execution and hopefully overcome the fault. But if you don't do it carefully, you can actually destroy the performance of regular execution also. You need to do execution, checkpointing, but while you're doing checkpointing, you should really start the next execution, if you will. Yes? Yeah, exactly. That's the trick, basically. How do you ensure that while getting high performance, meaning overlapping checkpointing and execution, you ensure that things are consistent? So you really need to do multiple buffering. So the next execution will start from a separate version of memory, if you will. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, but you should read the papers for a paper that I'm going to reference later on. Yes? So you have the right idea, basically. That's, that's one way of doing it, basically. You have separate states. One is operating on the current checkpoint. One, the other is operating on the new checkpoint. But you don't necessarily want to hard partition your memory. You want to create these new versions as you go along. But essentially, it amounts to having partition or new versions, if you will. It's a, it's a version type of memory. And in fact, you, don't need, you should really have three versions, not two versions, if you want to operate on two copies. Because you want to have the copy uh, that is really consistent, that you should never touch, and the copy you're currently operating on, and the copy the next execution is really operating on. So that has a lot of overhead. And clearly, how do you manage the overhead is important. And of course, you need to have DRAM in the system, so you need to somehow adapt to the characteristics of these things as well. Well, this was the advertisement for the talk, so, you can <laughs> so that people can come to the talk. But you can read. If you're interested, uh, there, is a, there is interesting literature. And this is a really open research topic at the moment. Uh, this is one of the papers. But the bigger issue is really, how do you uh, exploit persistence in the memory directly uh, exposed to the programming language while not making the programmers go crazy. So this is one example problem, but there is also other examples, like how do you ensure people actually start using this uh, in, a, in a manner that doesn't really... Uh, for, for example, another example is, if all of your memory is persistent, uh, a pointer that's corrupt can corrupt some random persistent data for some other application, right? How do you ensure that doesn't happen? Now today, if you, this is a lot harder to do with a file system because file system is, has a lot of guarantees uh, or has a lot of layers, if you will. All of that code that's executed ensures that you actually have the permissions to do that. But if your pointer is corrupt, you can actually corrupt any state uh, for which you have the permissions for in the virtual memory. So one of the uh, things that is interesting is developing libraries to help the programmers. And this is one approach that we've been looking at, basically. How do you actually develop a library that makes life easier for the programmer to figure out what objects in your program should be protected uh, or should be made persistent. Because not everything should be made persistent if you actually move to a persistent memory-based system. Some, some data is temporary, and they, they don't need to be written to a persistent part of memory. Right? How do you do that classification? turns out to be not an easy problem, actually. Okay, 
Any questions? I just want to give you uh, a brief overview of what the subject of the distinguished colloquium would be while touching on some related research topics. Yes? Is there a way to the Well, uh, that's, a, that's a great question, um, and that's also a research topic. Uh, so how do you actually ensure that? So, that's another problem, actually. If, if, if your memory is non-volatile, how do you ensure that uh, somebody doesn't observe the private uh, data that you may have over there? People have proposed, for example, encrypting uh, the, the non-volatile main memory. A lot of disks are encrypted today for the, for the very same reason that you're saying. Another solution could be keeping things volatile, but that may have issues also because you want some persistence. But I mean, like, like the mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> but what if, for example, let's say your memory control is always encrypting? Like yeah, it's like an atomic operation. So that's one solution to that problem, for example. But yes, if you're doing the encryption in bulk, uh, maybe when you're flushing stuff into me memory, or maybe over time, then yeah, you may, have, you may run into the problem that you're saying. <laughs> That's right. That's it. Yeah, memory is encrypted in Intel SGX, for example. Similar solutions can happen for non-volatile memory. I think the downside with a lot of those solutions is the encryption overhead, both in terms of performance and energy. OK. <laughs> that's, all, that's always a good advertisement, right? <laughs> From a researcher's perspective, that may not be true. From Intel's perspective, for selling products, that may be true, sure. <laughs> but from a researcher's perspective, I mean, it's very fundamental, right? Whenever you write to memory, you need to encrypt it. And that certainly adds some operation over there. If you can hide the performance penalty, maybe that's possible, but the energy penalty is still there. So some, uh, actually, a lot of mobile devices are so constrained in terms of energy that they may not want to adopt some of those solutions. So you may actually want to look for some other solution. <laughs> okay. It also depends on your design point, basically. Maybe it's, it's a great solution if you have a lot of processing power in a server, but maybe it's a tough solution if you're operating, uh, I don't know, out in the field, and you're a sensor collecting important data, and you need to write it to your persistent memory, but someone is out there easily attacking you, right? <laughs> It's not a sci-fi scenario anymore, I think. This, this will exist. This already exists, actually. OK, now let's move into multiprocessors. So that's an extreme form of multiprocessing. These sensors all over the place, <laughs> and they're coordinating. But we're going to be uh, more fundamental, and we'll start with an old paper that doesn't talk about sensors or anything. So this is uh, a paper that we briefly discussed. We've certainly discussed in digital circuits, but we've discussed it also when we talked about the GPUs. Uh, and this is Mike Flynn's classification of computing systems as to how, uh, uh, how they operate. Basically, there are SysD systems, single instruction operates on a single data element. Uh, there are SIMD systems, single instruction operates on multiple data elements. That's data parallelism, and you covered array and vector processors. There is a MISD type of processor, multiple instructions operate on a single data element, and single data element gets transformed as the instructions operate on them. This is not a perfect Thing, but the closest analogy for this is systolic arrays, which we've covered in digital circuits, but we've not covered in this lecture. And I recommend that you uh, take a look at the digital circuits lecture if you're interested in this, because systolic arrays is, for example, Google's tensor processing unit is essentially a systolic array. It's a very classic systolic array, if you will. Uh, okay, but we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about this last piece over here. Multiple instructions operate on multiple elements. You have multiple instruction streams, and they're completely independent. Well, they can be coordinating, uh, but they're operating independently on different data elements. So a multiprocessor is an example of this, or a multi-threaded processor, like a fine-grade multi-threaded processor, is another example of this. Multiple instruction, multiple data. If you hear the term MIMD, that's what it refers to. Multiple threads, essentially. OK. But before we, uh, basically it's a parallel computer. This is also called a parallel computer, but actually a parallel computer is uh, kind of a misnomer because all computers today exploit some sort of parallelism. If you think about pipelining, it's really a form of parallelism, right? You're really exploiting uh, 
very fine-grained instruction-level parallelism. It's the parallelism in the instruction cycle that you're exploiting. And every instruction is going through a different part of the instruction cycle in parallel. But usually when people refer to parallel computers, uh, it's usually SIMD or MIMD, and MIMD uh, more general. But let's talk about parallelism in general a little bit. Uh, parallelism at its broadest form means doing multiple things at a time. And anything can be parallel. You guys are parallel, actually. You're doing multiple things at a time, right? Things could be instructions, operations, and tasks from the viewpoint of a computer. So the main goal, the uh, main reason why this has been developed is really performance, right? Improving performance. You want to improve execution time or task throughput, depending on what kind of jobs you have. If you have a single task, you want to improve the execution time of it. But if you have a bunch of jobs, let's say simulations that you're running, that have nothing to do with each other except you want to finish all of them, then the task throughput is your performance metric in that case. And we'll see that the execution time is governed by Amdahl's law, as you're going to be reading. But there are many other goals. Maybe we should discuss some of them. Any thoughts? Why you would like to do things in parallel other than improving performance? I know you guys know. Yes? Sure. So that's true. Uh, I would consider that improving performance still. <laughs> I'm thinking about metrics. Like, what else can we improve in terms of metrics? Yeah? Energy efficiency, right? That's certainly one. Uh, you can reduce power consumption, right? energy consumption this way. Uh, for example, if you have parallel units, uh, if you have n units operating at frequency f, as opposed to that, you could have four n units, if you can parallelize your program four by 4x, and operate each of them at frequency f divided four by 4, or per have performance f divided four, uh, by 4 for each unit, you will still get the same performance, but the energy efficiency of this will be much better, right? Why? Remember the power equation? Power is equal to capacitance times voltage square times frequency. You reduce the frequency by 4. But now if you reduce the frequency by 4, you could reduce your voltage. Maybe not by 4, but let's assume in a perfect scaling world by 4. You can actually reduce your power consumption by 4 cube, right? That's 64x, while keeping your performance constant. And that's very powerful. And that's a very big motivation for parallelism, actually. A multi-core was motivated partly because of this. Not fully, but partly. If you can have a huge single-threaded program, one unit operating at performance F, why not have 4,000 units operating at performance F divided by 4,000? Now you get an energy efficiency of 4,000 cube increase. That's very compelling. Of course, this assumes that you can perfectly parallelize your program, right? Such that your performance will stay the same. And we've, see, we've already seen that that's not easy to do, and we're going to see more and more today. OK. Well, I guess I've given you one more over here. Uh, this is a freebie. <laughs> Basically, you can improve uh, cost efficiency and scalability and reduce complexity also, right? Maybe it's easier to design four N units that are operating at lower performance as opposed to one single unit that's operating at very high performance. And that's, this is really the reason for, oh, sorry, <laughs> moving to multi-core. Multi, it, it, it turned out it was very difficult to design a single-threaded processor that's operating at extremely high performance for that single thread. It was a lot easier to design a thousand cores that are operating, each operating at one thousandth the performance, one one thousandth the performance of that big core. That improves your, reduces your complexity clearly compared to designing that very hard to design unit, improves your cost efficiency and scalability also. But again, it assumes that your thing needs to be parallel, completely parallel, right? What about the third one? For those people who've seen it, they can stay sound. There's a third one actually, there's a third reason for parallel computation. Right, I'll give it to you because you may have seen this. But basically, it's really improving dependability. And this was actually one of the old reasons for, for this also. If you really want dependable execution, 
you run the same program in 10 different units, and basically they're voting in the output and uh, declare the output to be provided by most of the, uh, the units that agree on the output, the majority uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of all of the units that uh, provide the execution. So this is n modular redundancy, if you will. So if you have two units, for example, it's dual modular redundancy. You execute the program on two processors, and either they disagree or agree. If they agree, that's good. You assume the output is good. If they disagree, you assume there is an error. Now, if you have triple modular redundancy, if at least two of them agree, you assume that that's the output, right? And this is a very old reason for building parallel computers. Uh, in the old days, Tandem Computer was the first one, actually, who did this sort of execution in late 1970s, early 1980s. And uh, still people do that. Does that make sense? OK. So let's talk about some types of parallelism and how to exploit them. We've talked about instruction-level parallelism quite a bit. And as we've said, different instructions within a stream can be executed in parallel. Pipelining is an example of this, out-of-order execution, speculative execution, very, low, very long instruction word engines, and data flow are all examples of this. Right? Data parallelism is a more regular form of parallelism. Different pieces of data can be operated on in parallel, perhaps by the same instruction. Right? SIMD is an example of this. Systolic arrays and streaming processors are examples of this also. And there's also task-level parallelism. In this case, different tasks or threads can be executed in parallel. And this is really multi-threading and multi-processing. And existing GPUs combine uh, both in an interesting way, as we've discussed. As a result, they called it single instruction, multiple thread, right? SIMT engines. So you've seen parts of this before. Uh, but how do you create these tasks? Uh, because the task can be independent or dependent. So you can partition a single problem into multiple related tasks. We, let's call these threads. But they don't have to be threads, as we've discussed earlier. They could, in general, they're tasks. Uh, so you could do this explicitly by parallel programming. And this is relatively easy when tasks are natural in the problem for example, queries. But this is difficult when natural task boundaries are unclear. Right? And one example I've given before is uh, you have this huge book, and you're, you're really trying to do a histogram of the characters that appear in the book. Right? You can divide the book into, I don't know, 32 pieces, and uh, give one 30, 30 second uh, of, uh, of the book to each of the 32 threads that you've created. Right? And each thread counts on its own creates a local histogram, and then you merge those histograms with multiple threads or a single thread uh, to get the full thing. So that's parallel programming, essentially. And you're creating the task boundaries somehow, right? OK, or you could do this transparently, implicitly. Maybe a single thread can be partitioned speculatively. Think about the book example. You don't do it explicitly, but you write a single-threaded program that has a for loop that goes through every page but somehow, somebody, either the operating system or the runtime system or, uh, or the hardware, decides, oh, I'm going to start a new thread, assu assuming that there's going to be a huge loop iteration going through every single page. Maybe I have 1,000 pages, let's say. I'm going to start a new thread for every 30-second iteration. You could imagine someone doing that automatically, right? And that's essentially transparent, implicit. You, somebody didn't program it to be operated on multiple threads, but somebody's creating these threads automatically. And of course, somebody needs to ensure that those threads work correctly also. Runtime system could be doing that. Hardware could be doing that. And then it eventually, because the program is written in a single-threaded manner, somebody needs to stitch everything back together such that the outputs are as expected by the programmer, like a single-thread output. Right? This is, you can think of this as a task-level out-of-order execution, right? task-level parallel execution. That's uh, transparent. And people have actually st uh, strive for this a lot. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and the gains are not, have not been very impressive so far for this one. But here, gains can be impressive, of course, as we've seen before also. OK, if we have time uh, later, we may cover some of these thread-level speculation approaches. So this is all trying to partition a single problem into multiple related tasks, because the tasks are cooperating in the end. They're trying to come up with a single result uh, where all of them contribute to. But you can also have many independent tasks together, 
like parallel job simulations, right? You're, you're, you're designing the greatest processor of the future, and you want to simulate like the simulations you're doing for your lab, uh, lab assignment, and you want to run many different uh, versions of your memory controller, let's say, or, or data cache. And you want to figure out the best configuration. That's a very parallel task, and they have nothing to do with each other. So you can actually parallelize that uh, across many different processors, batch simulations, an example, different users, cloud computing workloads that have nothing to do with each other is another one, right? Uh, and this is relatively easy uh, when you have a lot of these tasks. But this doesn't improve the performance of a single task clearly, right? Because you're assuming that there are multiple tasks. So this is a more easier task. We're going we're to talk more about uh, this part today. And less so about this part. We're going to assume somebody has, somebody has provided you with threats. OK, but even this slide actually has a lot into it. Like some of the issues we've looked at, interference and resource contention plays into all of these. OK, let's talk about some fundamentals uh, first. So there are two types of multiprocessors, really, loosely coupled and tightly coupled. And the key difference between them is whether you have a shared global memory that's visible to the programmer. So loosely coupled, there is no shared global memory address space. This is like a network, essentially. Whereas tightly coupled, shared global memory address space. Uh, this network-based multiprocessor is here. This is what traditional multiprocessing is about, or symmetric multiprocessing. Existing multi-core processors, multi-thread processors, uh, all, all have this. Uh, and these are usually programmed via message passing. There are multiprocessors also. We've seen one example of this, the Tesseract uh, graph processing engine in memory. That was based on message passing, right? You explicitly call, uh, send calls uh, send and receive calls for communication. Remote function calls, for example, if you want to. Uh, distributed systems work this way. It's essentially a distributed system where the memory is separate for each processor, but if you want to operate together, you send a message to this processor, and that processor can execute a function on that message. Right? And then it can reply back with another message. That's essentially how distributed systems are programmed today. We're going to cover a lot of the shared global memory address space today, although this is very interesting too, but we don't have time uh, in this lecture. In this case, this is very interesting. The, the second one is very interesting because the programming model is very similar to uniprocessors. Right? You're assuming uh, really a single global memory address space, and all processors can load from that address space and store to that address space and communicate by doing loads and stores to a shared memory location, for example, or multiple shared memory locations. So it's really like a multitasking uniprocessor, except operations on shared data require some sort of synchronization. Right? And we're going to talk uh, about that. OK, there are many design issues in tightly coupled multiprocessors. How do you do the synchronization? How do you handle locks, atomic operations? We've talked about this briefly. We're not going to talk about higher level synchronization primitives that much. If you take a parallel programming course, you will see that a lot in the parallel programming course. How many of you have taken any parallel programming course? So you've seen synchronization primitives, like test and set, test and test and set, those things? Sound good? OK, good. You've seen different ways of doing the locks, locking, such that you don't run into starvation, fairness, dot, dot, dot. OK, you should definitely attend Michael Scott's lecture. Do you know about MCS locks? Yeah, that's Meller, Crummy, and Scott. And Scott is Michael Scott. <laughs> Yeah, basically, that's, uh, that's a way of doing uh, locking such that you reduce the overhead of, of locking significantly. OK, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to assume that that's done correctly, actually. <laughs> but we're going to talk about lower level issues in supporting that, because if the lower level issues are not done correctly, none of this really matters in the end, because you'll get incorrect execution. OK, we're going to talk about cache coherence. How do you ensure correct operation in the presence of private caches, memory consistency, ordering of memory operations? Shared resource management we talked a lot about, and communication interconnects, that's going to be one of the next lectures. OK, uh, load imbalance is a problem, as we've discussed uh, in the past. How do you partition a single task into multiple threads? That clearly affects how much parallel speed up you get, right? Remember the MDAL's law that I showed you earlier? We're going to see that again. But if you're not, uh, you're not balanced in terms of your load, uh, I'll give you the example again. You partitioned your uh, book. Uh, into 32 threads, and one of the threads get all, uh, gets all the 
uh, empty pages, let's say. <laughs> that thread clearly has a very low load, so it's going to finish early. So you're going to waste the processor that's executing that thread, right? Every other thread will have much more load. So that's a clear example of load imbalance. So your partitioning mechanism matters a lot in terms of your load. If you blindly partition, you may run into the situation I just said. A thread gets all empty pages or all pages with pictures where no, no, there's no character to count, right? Synchronization, uh, how do you synchronize efficiently between tasks? How do you communicate between them? And we've seen some of these things uh, as we've discussed when we talked about heterogeneous multi-core. Again, we're not going to talk about the higher level primitives over here, but we're going to talk about the lower level support like cache coherence and memory consistency in how to implement this. And ensuring correct operation while optimizing performance. This is really what parallel processing is all about, actually. How do you maintain correctness while maximizing your performance? We're not even talking about energy. Energy actually complicates things even more. But a lot of the design of parallel computers, both in the hardware as well as the software and the libraries and everything, uh, is really about this. OK, and we're going to get back to that. So just one aside. Uh, Hardware-based multi-threading is really an even more tightly coupled form uh, of multi-processing, if you will. Uh, basically, uh, tightly coupled in the sense that resource sharing is even higher between the threads, right? Basically, you have multiple threads that are concurrently running in a single pipeline, in this case, in a single core. And this could be coarse-grained, fine-grained, simultaneous. Coarse-grained is essentially, you may be quantum-based. Every quantum you switch to another thread. It could be event-based. Uh, for example, uh, Itanium 2 Intel's IE64 processors used to switch on an L3 miss. Whenever you get an L3 miss, you switch to another thread. And you have multiple thread contexts to switch between. It's relatively coarse-grained so that you can overlap the latency of the L3 miss, right? You could also do run-ahead. <laughs> Fine-grained is another one, uh, and we've seen this a lot. You, every cycle, you switch to some other thread, and that's the default mode of operation. And there are a lot of benefits to it, you will remember. And simultaneous is even more uh, finer grained. Basically, you don't switch every cycle, but there are all these instructions from different threads in the pipeline at the same time. So when one ALU is executing an instruction from thread A, another ALU may be executing an instruction from thread B, another ALU may be executing an instruction from thread C, another from thread D, dot, dot, dot. This is what Intel calls hyper-threading, really. It's really simultaneous multi-threading. It's even more fine-grained than here. But they can be combined, clearly. So simultaneous multi-threading doesn't assume that you switch every cycle to some other thread. You can be executing from this thread, but you can also be feeding instructions from this other thread, and they're both executing in an out-of-order manner. The out-of-order execution circuitry is operating on both of them. So whenever a thread has an instruction ready, that instruction gets scheduled into the functional unit. As a result, you may have actually multiple instructions from different threads scheduled to different functional units at the same time. So if we get a chance to cover multi-threading, we'll uh, go into more detail uh, in, in terms of simultaneous multi-threading, actually how it's implemented in existing processors. So the good thing over here is you can improve execution unit utilization. If you have 16 different execution units, all of them are going to be operating on 16 different threads at the same time. Whereas in terms of coarse grain, clearly coarse grain, you don't have multiple threads active at the same time. Fine-grained, you have only one thread uh, that's going through a single pipeline stage at a given time. So simultaneous is much more finer-grained. OK, that's an aside. But that's really, uh, this is, again, multiprocessing. All of the issues that we're going to discuss happen in multi-thread processors also. OK, before we move on, let's talk about the MDAL's law a little bit more, because uh, this, is, this should always be on the back of everyone's heads. We're always going to be, uh, we'll, we'll always be limited by the parallel speed up. And the paper that you're reading uh, is going to talk about that also, three pages. Remember, I said that Amdahl was concerned about the power of parallel processing. And his paper is titled, The Validity of the Single Processor Approach in Improving Processor Performance. Right? He was arguing, basically, oh, actually, you should really improve single processors. But before uh, we go into Amdahl's law, let's have some fun. <laughs> So this is a polynomial evaluation, right? This is a, assume a i, where i is 0 through 4, are constants, x is an input. This is a polynomial that we want to evaluate. 
Now assume we are given the inputs x and each ai. I'm going to ask you some questions. Assume each operation takes one cycle. For example, this uh, addition takes one cycle and a multiplication takes one cycle. And you can see that there are many additions and multiplications when you want to evaluate this polynomial. And assume there is no communication cost, and each operation can be executed in a different processor. So you're really limited by one cycle add, one cycle uh, multiply. The first question is, how fast is this with a single processor? Single processor, basically, a single processor can do one single operation at a given time, either an add or a multiply. No parallel functional units. <laughs> Here. And there's no pipelining or anything. Assume you're one cycle, you do the add. One cycle, you do the multiply. Fourteen. Okay, any other takers? You can use pen and, pa <laughs> pen and paper also. Although you guys are smart, you could compute this in your head. I cannot. <laughs> I have my cheat sheets over there. <laughs> Anybody do better than 14? Or worse than 14? Maybe 14 is an incorrect program. Think about it a bit. You would say 12? OK. What else? 17? OK. 11? OK. That's good. I have 11, a range of 11 to 17. That's good. Anything else? No? Anybody doing better than 11? Who, who, th who thinks it's 11? OK, multiple people. Who votes for 12? I heard 12 also. OK. <laughs> who votes for 14? Well, <laughs> 17? Long mode. Any other takers? <laughs> okay, keep that in mind. We're going to get back to this. <laughs> what about, uh, well, I said this already. What about with three processors? Uh, a tougher question, maybe, or easier question. Three processors meaning each processor is the same again. It can do only one addition or multiplication. But now you have three of them. And when you need to communicate the results, there is no latency. We're going to ignore even that latency right now. So you can have three processors doing three multiplications at the same time, or any combination of multiplication or addition. Say again? Four, Four cycles. That's right. Yes? Five cycles, OK? Four? Uh, you're not sure about four? You're sure about five, sounds like? Pretty sure? That's good. I like the pretty sure. <laughs> what else? Remember, there's a correctness performance trade-off here. You can get four, but it may be incorrect. <laughs> that's exactly what, what this is about, actually. <laughs> well, this is not exactly about that, but that's one of the examples that could come about. I could actually do all of this in zero cycles, except I'll give you a random result. <laughs> Any other takers? People, somebody says five. Who says five? Who agrees with five? OK, one more. <laughs> Why is it related to the previous answer? <laughs> OK, maybe there's some relation that I don't quite understand at the moment. Okay, 
Did I move on? Or anybody else attempting to do this? Okay, I'll, I'll move on, I think. <laughs> so the first answer, uh, those of you who said 11 were right. And I'm sure everybody else is right by definition, because you can add delays, arbitrary delays, <laughs> and make it 17. Uh, and we will see why is it 11. And the second one, 5, is actually the minimum, I believe, uh, while maintaining correctness. So I think you got the 5 right. <laughs> uh, so uh, how would you do this? Basically, I would, well, if I were first thinking about it, if I didn't know better, I would probably take out the x's, right? And then reuse them somehow. So this is one example, basically. Single processor, you have 11 operations. Because it's a single processor, it takes 11 cycles, right? And this is a data flow graph. So I would have an x tree over here, x squared, x cubed, x to the 4. I would generate them. And I would basically uh, multiply the respective a's with whatever I generated. This is a1, x1, sorry, a1, x, a2, x squared, a3, x cubed, and then a4, x4. And then I would add, and then there's an addition tree, right? And this is a logical way of doing it. That sounds good, right? 11 cycles. And the multiprocessor version, you'll need to think a little bit more about it. This is a parallel version, basically. Uh, you could take the same thing and parallelize it, essentially. <laughs> and that's what you get, basically. Which ones are parallel? x squared, a3x, a1x over here, and then add a1x plus a0. And you can go through this, basically. This is, this is what determines. This is the critical path, if you will, because you need to go through a4, x to the fourth. You need to compute x to the fourth. And then you need to do the addition in between somehow. OK? I don't think there's a better version than this. If someone comes up with really false four cycles, let me know. <laughs> OK, so basically, speed up with three processors, in this case, is 11 divided by 5, right? That's 2.2. .2. Clearly, we didn't get 3x speed up on this workload, which is unfortunate. But the first question that you should really ask yourself when you're doing this sort of parallel speed-up comparison is, is this a fair comparison? So what is really speed-up? Speed-up really should be defined as the best algorithm on a single processor divided by the best known, alg so best known algorithm to do the computation on a single processor divided by the best known algorithm uh, uh, on the multi multiple processor system and the time taken for those algorithms. So the question is, have you used the best algorithms? Anybody wants to challenge the 11 or the 5? Well, I cannot challenge the 5 because I don't know a better algorithm. But I'll actually challenge the 11, which will probably draw our speed ups to a lower thing. You can actually do better than the single processor uh, algorithm that we looked at before. What we looked at was this thing over here, and it actually had a lot of operations. But uh, somebody smart called Horner developed a method to, for polynomial evaluation a long time ago, as you can see, almost 200 years ago now, I think, yeah. Uh, and maybe somebody else did that before him, but he's definitely for the first one who wrote the paper about it. But have you guys studied Horner's method? for polynomial evaluation in high school, probably? OK, you remember? OK, good, excellent. <laughs> now you're going back to all that high school knowledge, right? So that's where your high school knowledge matters, in developing algorithms. So if you actually go back and look at Horner's method, and you can actually have nice ways of doing it. I'm not going to go through it. And this is a nice paper that talks about it. But basically, you take out uh, progressively uh, uh, the x's over here. And you have the minimal number of operations in that case. And what, what, what it looks like is this. And it's only eight operations. Basically, you get eight cycles on a single processor. And if you do the comparison of the speed up, you're now down to 1.6. So that's one caveat of parallelism. Uh, if you really want to get the benefits, you really need to show the benefits compared to the best algorithms with a single processor version. So if the single processor version can be optimized even more, you may decide to build a big parallel processor, but you may not really get a lot of performance because somebody else optimized their single processor code. 
That's always true, but I think it's especially true for this case. Okay, so this actually brings me to another point over here. Uh, can speed up be greater than p with p processing elements? In fact, if you don't pick the best algorithm, you could easily get speed up that's greater than p. You have a terrible single processor algorithm. I don't want to put you on the spot, but 17 cycles. Divided by 5 is greater than 3.4. Uh, 3, right? That's 3.4. So you would get super linear speed up. And whenever you see super linear speed up, you should really think, why is it happening? One of the reasons may be the comparison is not fair. And that's, you, that's, that's a very valid reason. So what is super linear speed up? Basically, you plot the processor. We've seen this graph before, right? The scalability curves. This is called a scalability curve also. You have the number of processors or number of threads. This is the speed up compared to the single threaded version. This is the linear regime. And typical success looks like this, as we've seen. In fact, it actually drops later on, as we've seen in the heterogeneous multi-core lecture. And atypical success is super linear. <laughs> but there are usually reasons for it. Unfair comparisons could be one reason. Uh, you can compare the best parallel algorithm to a Wimpy serial algorithm. As a result, that's unfair. And the other thing could be you may be adding some things other than processors into the system. Now, this may be a valid reason, but it's not necessarily just because of processing power you're adding but it's really because of cache you're adding, for example. For example, if you have uh, more processors, you may have more cache and memory, and your working set magically starts fitting into the cache. Now you don't get misses anymore. As a result, your speed up shoots up at some point when your working set starts fitting into your cache or memory. And that's a reason to get super linear speed up. That's a valid reason, but it's not because, coming because of the processors. It's coming because of something else in the system. Right? That may be true for disks or network also, right? If you're adding more network connections, for example, getting more network bandwidth because you're adding more processors, you may be getting super linear speed up. Okay, but this is uh, a cautionary tale so that you should be careful when you see this sort of uh, super linear speed ups. Okay, let's define some other metrics. We had some fun. Let's have some more fun. So there are some traditional metrics uh, that are used to talk about processors. These are old, but I think they're, they're very instructive. Uh, utilization is one, redundancy is another, and efficiency is another. Utilization is basically how much processing capability are you using compared to how much you're tying up. So basically, this is the number of operations in the parallel version divided by how many processors you're tying up for how long of a time. We'll see this uh, with a pictorial example. Redundancy is how much extra work you're causing because of additional parallelism, and usually your redundancy is more than one, higher. This is the number of operations in the parallel version divided by number of operations in the best single processor algorithm version. And efficiency is basically a combination of the, both. Time with one processor divided by processors times time with P processors. How much efficiency you have compared to uh, the best single processor version. Basic efficiency is utilization divided by redundancy. So let's take a look at these based on the example I've given. Remember, uh, utilization is how much processing capability we're using. We're assuming we're tying up three processors, that's the three processors that we have, for five time units. That's the best uh, uh, algorithm we had for the three processors, right? We're really tying up five of them for three cycles, so we're really tying them up for 15 time units. We're assuming that all processors are tied up until parallel computation finishes. Now, of course, with multi-threading, this assumption changes, but uh, this is a pure metric. But we're not doing operations on all of them. As you can see, there's some load imbalance in the processors over here. This processor executes five operations, this processor three operations, this processor two operations. So if you go back to this picture, that's how I got this picture, this one. Five operations on this processor, three on this, and two on this. So our utilization is 10 out of 15, basically. OK, redundancy is how many operations do we have with the three processor version, 10. How many operations do we have with the best single processor version, 8. So our redundancy is greater than 1. This is actually a good way of checking whether you have the best single processor version or not. If your redundancy is less than 1 or equal to 1, you should have a question. Maybe I don't have the best single processor version. Because parallel, adding parallelism usually adds redundancy to your program. You need to do some more work uh, to, to get the benefits of parallelism. In this case, clearly, we did some more work, more operations, basically. 
And in fact, uh, I actually uh, didn't count some of the operations, like the communication, right? We didn't even count the communication between the processors, so that adds even more operations. And if you have some other uh, uh, data set, some other problem, you may actually need to copy the data, such that different processors need to operate on different copies of the data, and that adds even more redundancy into the system. In this case, we looked at a very simple version. We didn't need to deal with communication or copying of the data. So usually this redundancy is much higher than one. If you're getting really close to one, you should always question yourself. Maybe I really don't have the best single processor version. So efficiency is how much resource we use compared to how much resource we can really get away with. Basically, tying up one processor for the best uh, execution time units divided by tying up P processors for the time units that we've seen. We, if you had the best algorithm for a single processor, you would tie it up for eight time units. With the multiprocessor version, we tied up three processors for five time units. So our efficiency is actually a little bit over 50% in this case. We're not very efficient if you think about it. And this correlates with energy efficiency, certainly. But energy efficiency is much broader than this because you need to take into account frequency, voltage, dot, dot, dot. Okay, hopefully these are simple. But they actually give insight into how well your, operating, uh, how well your parallel processor is really operating. SIMD efficiency, SIMD utilization that we've seen in GPUs is another example of this, actually. Uh, a very GPU-specific version of it. How many of these thread slots that you're tying up versus how many of those that you're really using, right? Here, essentially, that's what we have, except not in that context. Okay, so let's talk about Amdahl's law. Uh, you've seen this before. That's the parallel speed-up curve. So why do we have this reality over here? Clearly, we have diminishing returns, and at some point, things go down over here, although it's not clear if Amdahl's law see that things go down. But we're going to talk about those things going down later on. So why do we have this reality? Clearly, we have uh, diminishing returns. We have a paralyzable portion of the program, and we can speed that up perfectly, assuming. Uh, and we have a non-parallelizable portion of the single-threaded program. That's nice. This is where redundancy helps, I think. I'll bring my other processor. Yeah. <laughs> or an extra source of battery would help also. <laughs> but let's, we'll have to make do with this. OK, that's good. Uh, well, I like the green better, I think. Okay, so basically, uh, this is the time it's take, uh, it takes to execute with P processors. It's the parallelizable fraction times time it takes to execute with one processor divided by P, P assuming this perfectly parallelizable, this fraction uh, alpha is perfectly parallelizable, and this is a non-parallelizable part. Basically, non-parallelizable fraction times the execution time with single processor. Right. It makes sense, and then you can calculate the speed up with P processors as T1 divided by PP, and this is what you get. And as speed up, as P goes to infinity, you have an infinite number of processors, this is uh, what this equation boils down to. So your bottleneck for parallel speed up is really this parallelizable fraction in the end. Right? And we can draw nice curves. Let's do that. This is my handwriting, sorry. I'm, I'm, it takes a lot of time to draw these actually with Excel, so. <laughs> I'll make you uh, read this. But I think the key, the key is very simple. I have one graph with Excel later on. But basically, adding more and more processors gives less and less benefits if alpha is less than 1. Right. This is alpha 4.9, alpha 4.95, alpha 4.98. And if, if alpha is 1, then you'll get linear speed up, actually, assuming parallel portion is per perfectly parallel. But this is why you get the diminishing returns. And I'll, see, I'll show you a, a similar result. So that's one illustration of Amdahl's law. Now I can turn it aside, and you can put the alpha over here, and you can put the speed up over here. And you'll see that the benefit, i.e. the speed up from parallel processing, is small until you get alpha that's really close to 1. And this is also in interesting because you may not always... Uh, so this is the perspective of, oh, you have some program, and you want to parallelize it. How many processors should you use? And this is the perspective of, maybe I have some number of processors, P1, P2, P3, and I'm going to develop my software to become better. Right. 
And how do you develop your software to become better? You're, you change your alpha. Right? You try to find the opportunities for reducing the serial part. And as your alpha grows, becomes more parallel, your program becomes more and more parallel, you get closer to this uh, peaking part of the curve. But it takes a long time to get there. <laughs> and I'll show you uh, an example of this in a little bit. Basically, your benefit is small until alpha is really close to 1. And this is obvious, right? Your alpha is 50%. The maximum speed up is 2x. Your alpha is 99%. Uh, your maximum speed up is 100x. Your alpha is 100%. Your maximum speed up is infinite, assuming you have infinite number of processors. I guess a mathematician should, would say it's technically undefined. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, we're not mathematicians. <laughs> OK. So uh, let's talk about caveats of parallelism a little bit, and then I'll uh, finish it after we're done with the parallelism of ca uh, caveats of parallelism. I've shown you this slide before, actually. This is the same view over here. So clearly, maximum speedup is limited by the serial portion. You have the serial bottleneck. But what MDAS law does not even consider is this part. This is the parallel part, right? Parallel portion is not perfectly parallel, usually. And remember, I said that this is a perfect memorization question for an exam. Why? There are three reasons. One is synchronization overhead, because you have updates to share data, and there's some communication overhead, which we ignored in the previous example. There's load imbalance, as we've seen, imperfect parallelization. Three processors doesn't mean that all of them are operating in sync. Uh, some of them may have a bigger load. And there's resource sharing overhead, which you really, did, really didn't consider in the previous example either, right? When one processor is accessing memory, the other will be not be accessing memory because there's a resource conflict, right? And we've seen this a lot earlier. So all of these actually reduce this equation and make it much more complicated than we can actually model today. But that's actually a really interesting direction. How do you model, put these things into Amdahl's law such that you can actually have a better model for the parallel speed up? Not easy. But you should always uh, be thinking about these things. Uh, you, we're not always dividing by n. This n actually gets, uh, this gets divided by very little. And if you're completely serialized because of this, then you're back to square one. You're not even dividing by n, right? <laughs> OK. So this is the sequential bottleneck. I said I promised one Excel figure. <laughs> and this is my Excel figure. It's ugly. I think my handwriting is nicer, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> At least I can make my point better with my handwriting. But this is a parallel fraction going from 0 to 1. This is a speed up. And as you can see, with 10 processors, we get to 10 over here. But we start getting to 10 very late. Now, if you have 100 processors, we start getting to 100 really late, close to 100. The curve shoots up really late over here, after 80%. And if you have 1,000 processors, in order to get to 1,000, you really need to be more than 96% parallel. So that's the curse of the sequential bottleneck. That's essentially exactly why the Cray-1 machine that we've discussed was the fastest scalar machine of its time. Cray was a smart guy. All of those architects were smart people. They said, we have this parallel machine. We can do great in these parts of the program. But in the end, if we want to get speed up, we've got to do really, really well in these parts of the program so that we're not bottlenecked by it. And that's, essentially, that's exactly why they designed the scalar uh, unit to be really uh, fast. So there are many reasons for the sequential bottleneck. For example, non-parallelizable operations on data. And this is uh, clearly an example uh, that's looking at the extremes, right? There are also sequential bottlenecks that are relatively less, more sequential than this one. Maybe you have two threads. Reduction operations, for example, tend to be sequential at some point. You start with many, many, a lot of parallelism, but you're reducing the data. For example, you're doing an addition across many number of elements. You can think of that as a tree, for example, right? And as you go down the tree, your parallelism reduces. And you have a really sequential portion and tiered sequential portions. Uh, but basically, you have non-parallelizable operations on data. Non-parallelizable loops is a really good example of the sequential bottleneck. If you cannot parallelize it because there are a lot of dependencies between different loop iterations, you're bottlenecked. One example could be this. But you can, of course, try to parallelize it. Just don't do it right now. And there are other causes as well. For example, single thread prepares data and spawns parallel tasks. It's usually sequential uh, to do that, actually, because you, you touch a lot of shared data, and you may want to keep it sequential, actually. 
Okay, so this is one example from a paper that you're reading. This is a critical section execution acceleration paper. And we have this example in that this is essentially one thread uh, is spawning threads over here, for example. You have a priority queue of tasks, and the thread uh, that's executing this part A is actually spawning a bunch of threads. And for each thread, you're doing some stuff. And this is a critical section. It's removing a task from this priority queue that was prepared by this initial thread. Uh, and removing the task is cl clearly uh, accessing the shared priority queue, so you need to lock it. And then after you remove it, you have the parallel portion. Everybody can do this in parallel because you already copied the problem and solving it on your own. And then when you actually create new problems based on that, you insert it to the priority queue. So this is an example of a dynamic tasking program. A lot of programs can be programmed using this dynamic task level parallelism. Uh, and each thread does this many times. Eventually, they figure out that, oh, we've solved the problem. And somebody needs to print the solution. And printing the solution could be a sequential task also. Right? Assuming you have one communicating thread with your print driver, right? Now, that's, these A and E are your sequential bottlenecks. C, C1 and C2 are your critical sections. D1 and D2 are parallelizable portions. Right? And this is an example timeline from this paper. A may be long. You have a long sequential portion. And you have a parallel portion over here. And you have, at the end, maybe a long sequential portion also. So you're really bottlenecked by these two. And now in the parallel portion, you have idle times because of critical sections, for example, over here. And this shows only the critical sections. It doesn't show the load imbalance. Well, I guess this is the load imbalance over here, if you think about it, right? <laughs> it's, uh, this is done over here. Uh, and uh, it basically, the other threads reach the barrier over here at the very end, or at the end, of the, uh, at the end of the loop at the very end. So there is some load imbalance over here. But this doesn't show the contention, resource contention issues in the parallel section. So parallel programs, every one of them looks like this, actually, if you look at the execution. OK. So bottlenecks in parallel portion. Clearly, uh, synchronization is one bottleneck. right? Basically, uh, operations manipulating shared data cannot be parallelized. You can try to parallelize them, but you run into other overheads. Uh, we've covered this, locks, mutual exclusion, barrier synchronization. This is also a communication problem, basically. Whenever you're synchronizing, you need to be communicating. Uh, and tasks may need values from each other. Essentially, the, I'll, I'll use these interchangeably. Communication, if you're doing it right, you need to be communicating only when you're synchronizing on shared data. OK, the downside is this causes thread serialization when shared data is contended. Right? Load imbalance, we've seen parallel tasks may have different lengths. And this could be due to imperfect parallelization. This could also be due to microarchitectural effects. For example, you have an unfair memory scheduler and you divided your program, and memory scheduler prioritized the streaming thread, as we've seen very early on, right? If it prioritizes the streaming thread and uh, slows down the random access thread, these may be cooperating together on different portions of the data. Uh, as a result, the random access thread reaches the barrier, the end of the parallel part, late. And you have a load imbalance because of a purely microarchitectural effect. This could also happen in the cache, dot, dot, dot. So resource contention can lead to a load imbalance also. Or, for example, one of, the one of the threads can be executing on a processor that's not as fast as the other one. That could also happen. Maybe it's, uh, that processor is currently throttling for some reason because it's closer to a heat source. Right? These things happen, actually. These are real <laughs> life issues that may lead to load imbalance, even though you may have perfectly parallelized your program across different threads. OK, this clearly reduces speed up in the parallel portion. And resource contention, as we've seen, parallel tasks can share hardware resources delaying each other. Right? Uh, so clearly, replicating all resources is expensive over here. And this causes additional latency not present when each task run, runs along. For example, you get row buffer thrashing, right? or you get thrashing in the cache. So your performance actually can degrade for all tasks compared to when you run alone. This, this is not handled well. That's why we dedicate a lot of time to this one. And we'll talk about how to support synchronization at the uh, architecture level today. So another view of this, uh, threads in a multi-thread application can actually be interdependent as opposed to threads from different applications. And they synchronize with each other with these things. And we've actually seen some of these. 
Some threads can be on the critical path of execution, whereas some threads are not. And we've seen this before. That's why I'm going to repeat this relatively quickly. But even within a thread, some code segments may be on the critical path of execution, some are not. So it's always good to think about that. Uh, and we've tried to accelerate these code segments, if you remember, with the state execution model with heterogeneous multi-core processors. We were going toward that direction. Uh, but I want to jog your memory. Basically, uh, critical sections are there to enforce mutually exclusive access to shared data. We've seen this in the previous example. And only one thread can be executing at a time. And Contended critical sections make other threads wait, and thread-causing serialization can be on the critical path. We, I've, sh I've shown you these slides, that's why I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, and remember, uh, because we're going to deal with issues like this. Well, deal with the hardware support to actually make these things work. So barriers, they lead to a synchronization point, and the thread that's leaching the barrier, barrier the last determines your execution time. And threads that are reaching the barrier early need to wait for all threads that reach the barrier. Right? And we've discussed how to optimize this before. So if you have a heterogeneous multi-core processor, you ship the critical path thread to, that, to the large core. That's one example. Or you could save power in this thread by reducing the frequency and voltage at this point, right? OK. And we've seen the pipeline parallel programs as well, right? You can have a loop iteration that's divided into code segments called stages. And you may divide stages such that, for example, uh, Part A in each iteration is operating on some data set that tends to stay constant. Uh, and this part B is operating on some other data set. And this part C is operating on some other data set. And if you actually partition those data sets, and if you partition the loop into different threads or stages, A, B, C, you can actually execute those A, B, C in different processors where the data sets reside. And as a result, you can exploit locality. And maybe you can actually customize those processors for uh, these computations as well. So that's what this thing looks like. These gets, this gets different instances of A, this gets different instances of B, and this gets different instances of C. And the way you communicate between A, B, and C in a single iteration is through these queues, which could be software-based or hardware-based again. But again, your bottleneck becomes the one that's lagging. The slowest stage uh, determines your throughput and parallel performance in the end. In this case, the slowest stage is stage B. It's always taking... Uh, long, as a result, it's determining your speed up. Okay, so uh, I think this is my last slide before we take a break. Basically, uh, parallel programming is not easy, uh, but it's easy if parallelism is really natural. So if you have embarrassingly parallel applications, those are actually relatively easier cases. A lot of multimedia workloads, for example, graphics, uh, physical simulation, they actually have a lot of embarrassingly parallel parts. Those are the easy parts. And maybe large web servers and databases, the throughput-oriented parts are actually the easy parts. But whenever you're operating on shared data in any of these, it becomes hard also. So the shared parts of all of these uh, applications, for example, how do you do the locking in a database when you have a billion requests coming into your database? That becomes actually really tough because you have a bottleneck shared data portion. That could be true for a web server also. So difficulty is really uh, optimizing uh, those parts uh, where you have these bottlenecks, as we've seen. I'll call all of them bottlenecks in general. Uh, synchronization, load imbalance, and resource contention. They all lead to bottlenecks. So difficulty is really getting parallel programs to work correctly while optimizing performance in the presence of these bottlenecks. So you could give either of them up. <laughs> And you could get a really good parallel computer. You could give correctness up. Well, I don't know what you get out of that. Maybe this approximate computing, <laughs> assuming it works. Uh, maybe that's not a good thing to give up. But you can give performance up, and you can easily get correctness. Right? But the real interesting thing is, much of, and that's what much of parallel computer architecture, and much of what we will talk about will be about, is designing machines, machines meaning complete platforms, hardware and software, that overcome the sequential and parallel bottlenecks to achieve higher performance and efficiency while ensuring that the programmers don't go crazy. Basically, making programmers' job easier in writing correct and high-performance parallel programs. Again, you can give this up. This becomes really easy. And you can give this up. Uh, and this becomes really hard, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. 
So that's why we're going to cover memory ordering. This is a perfect example of this trade-off, actually. Uh, but we will do that after we take some number of minutes of break. How about nine minutes so that we're back here at 14.40? Okay, let's get started. Are the lights still good? Nobody's falling asleep yet? The topics are so exciting that you cannot fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, that's going to get even more interesting, I think, <laughs> like every, every other lecture. Okay, this is where we left off. Uh, basically, much of parallel computer architecture is about designing machines that overcome the sequential and parallel bottlenecks to achieve higher performance and efficiency while ensuring that the programmer is staying sane and productive. Sane may be easy, but productive is hard, actually. <laughs> OK, so we'll look into memory ordering in multiprocessors. Uh, this is uh, actually this is a seminal paper that I mentioned earlier, and these are some other papers uh, that are very interesting to read. First, I will dis uh, there are two kinds of orderings, actually, we will, we will cover. The first one is a global ordering. That's called memory consistency. Unfortunately, the naming is not that great because they're both consistency issues. But memory consistency usually refers to ordering of all memory operations from different processors to different memory locations. Where basically we're concerned ourselves with we're concerning ourselves with all memory operations. Cache coherence, which you will cover later, basically it's a global ordering of all access of access to all memory locations. The other one's coherence which is about the ordering of operations from different processors to the same memory location. It's really about the consistency for a single location. They're related, and we may talk about the relationship later on, but they're very different. This is really a local ordering of access to each cache block. It's, it's really to each word of memory, but we're going to generalize it to each cache block because things operate in the cache block granularity today, but they don't have to all the time. Okay. We should really distinguish between the two. We're going to talk about consistency first, global ordering of access to all memory locations from different processors. As I said, much of parallel computer architecture is about designing these machines that overcome the sequential and parallel bottlenecks while making programmers' job easier in writing correct and high-performance parallel programs. So that's where the ordering comes into play, basically, whether you make the programmer's job easier. Let me give you an overview of this ordering across different processors. We've actually seen this before uh, in the single core as well as data flow case. So let's assume we have operations A, B, C, D. You can assume that they're memory operations. They don't have to be, but let's take memory uh, for now. In what order should the hardware execute and report the results of these operations? That's the key question that we're asking. And we've asked this question before. There are two issues here. There's a contract between the programmer and the architect or microarchitect that's specified by the ISA. That is the order that's specified by, that's exposed to the programmer, right? And preserving an expected order, more accurately, an agreed upon order, simplifies programmer's life. That's the ISA specified order. That's the architecture. What is visible to the programmer, right? Underneath, the architecture can do anything, again. But what is visible to the programmer is what matters for the programmer to not go crazy right, and be, stay productive. Uh, because it, may, it, it changes how easy debugging is, how easy state recovery is, how easy exception handling, how easy reasoning about your program is. And clearly, there's a trade-off here, because preserving an expected order usually makes the hardware designer's life difficult, and especially if the goal is to design a high-performance processor. Remember, we had the reorder buffer that's added in an out-of-order execution processor. An out-of-order execution processor had a sequential instruction stream. Uh, it fetched in sequence in program order, and it executed things out of order in the data flow order in a restricted manner. And it had to reorder all of those instructions when it updated the architectural state, including registers and memory. And this was difficult because you need to keep a lot of state. You need to ensure load and store stores get correctly ordered. And we've discussed how do you ensure order, right? Whenever you get a load instruction, it needs to check whether all of the store instructions, if, if it's dependent on any of the store instructions that are older. Right? So you need to actually do a content addressable memory comparison to all of the addresses. Actually, it's a range of addresses, and in an ordered manner. 
So actually, the hardware becomes very, very complex, even with a single core processor in this case. So clearly, there's a trade-off between the programmer and the microarchitect. And the reason auto word execution is successful, as we've discussed, is because we've obeyed that sequential execution semantics. And all of those machines that did not obey that sequential execution semantics disappeared. IBM 36091, CDC 6600, those were the first machines that implemented auto word execution 40, 50 years ago. And they were not successful. Auto word execution became successful. Then people said, oh, we need to reorder the instructions when we make it visible to the architecture in 1984, 1985, and later first incarnated in Motorola 88000 and also Intel Pentium Pro. OK. So in a single processor, we had this issue, basically. The memory ordering visible to the program is specified by the von Neumann model. And it's a sequential order. Hardware executes the load and store operations in the order specified by the sequential program. It's very simple. Auto word execution does not change the semantics. It changes the implementation. Hardware executes the operations in any order it wishes. As long as it retires or reports to the software the results of the load and store operations in the order specified by the sequential program. Right. So it obeys the contract. The advantages for the programmer, architectural status precise within an execution, and architectural status consistent across different runs of the program. Right. So if you have a bug in your program, you'll consistently fail at the same place. So whenever you're debugging, it's easy. You can reproduce the bug. Right. Because if you have a bug, uh, the bug will appear at some point. And when, when the program crashes or does something weird, gets, gets an access protection, for example, you know that it stopped at that instruction that caused that problem. Or, and the last instruction that was retired was the instruction just before it. And no other instruction that came after this instruction affected any of the state. That's the beauty of von Neumann model. Now you can debug programs really, really easily. Disadvantage, preserving order adds overhead, reduces performance, increasing complexity, reduces scalability. And this is all the baggage of implementing out-of-order execution in a, in a manner that's hidden from the programmer. Yes? Well, uh, executing out-of-order out and preserving order uh, because of, for example, this load store queues, right? That, that's actually pretty complex, yeah. Basically, all of that machinery that you need to add to ensure that you need to report the instructions in the correct uh, order adds complexity. And as a result, it reduces scalability because now you have a more complex engine and you can put only a few of those into your area budget, right? Okay, and we've seen that trying to... Uh, Reduce these overheads is an open research problem. OK, so that's memory ordering in a single processor. We've also seen, uh, to some extent, memory ordering in a data flow process. This is completely op opposite end, right? Basically, a memory operation executes when its operations are ready. And ordering is specified only by data dependencies. That's the contract. So the programmer should not expect anything <laughs> in this case. Two operations can be executed and retired in any order if they have no dependency. The advantage is lots of parallelism, so you get high performance, because the, uh, you're not constrained to a sequential order. Right? Now, the disadvantage is are many. Precise state is very hard to maintain, as we've discussed, because things may execute in any order. Right? And it's very hard to debug. Whenever your program crashes, or whenever you put a breakpoint, you don't know what to execute it. Right? And order actually can change across runs of the same program also. So this one is, uh, even if you don't execute the same program twice, it's very hard to debug because you don't know where things stopped. So if you take a memory dump, for example, it's very hard to examine because you don't know what if operations executed unless you dump everything, including, oh, this operation is in this stage, this operation is in this stage, dot, 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 which becomes unwieldy. Actually, that was one way of debugging uh, programs if you, don't, if you didn't have precise state. There were machines that dump dumped the entire pipeline stage state to memory. And it was the programmer's job to figure out which operations execute and which operations didn't update the memory state. Now, that's terrible, right? You don't want to do that. It's already difficult to debug programs with the bugs we have. You don't want to deal with the pipeline state. So this is hard. Within a, within a single execution, you don't know the precise state. 
But across executions, you also don't know, uh, you, you, all, you can get different results because things happen based on the dynamic order of events, right? So a data flow processor is very difficult to program because there is no guarantee in terms of ordering at all. Right? And as a result, nobody really implements data flow processors today. Out of order execution is the best approximation, but it's really not data flow at the ISA level. It's really data flow at the microarchitecture level. Right? So we're going to see similar issues in multiprocessors. Multiprocessors are actually between these two extremes. And we're going to see the issues related to it. We're, going to, we're not going to solve all of the issues, but we're going to look at one of the issues. So for example, we're not going to solve the issue of order changing across the rounds of the same program. OK, so let's take a look at the issues over here. So each processor's memory operations are in sequential order with respect to the thread running on that processor. So we're going to assume that each processor obeys the von Neumann model, because that's a good model. Uh, multiple processors execute memory operations concurrently. The key question is, how does the memory see the order of operations from all processors? In other words, what is the ordering of operations across different processors? And the first question you should ask is, why does it even matter? <laughs> well, it matters because of the things that we've discussed, actually. Ease of debugging, correctness, and performance and overhead. Ease of debugging, basically, it's nice to have the same execution done at different times to have the same order of execution, repeatability. We're not going to solve that problem, but there are issues related to that also. We're going to focus more on this one, uh, mainly, for correctness. Basically, the key question I'm going to ask is, can we have incorrect execution in the order of memory op if the order of memory operations is different from the point of view of different processors? If this processor observes memory operations in some order versus this other processor observes memory operations in some other order, will that lead to correctness issues? And the answer will be yes. That's why this is interesting. <laughs> Even when each processor obeys the uh, von Neumann model. A ghost coming in, I think. <laughs> uh, OK, and we're going to talk about performance and overhead a little bit, although not a lot, because we just don't have time. Because enforcing a strict sequential ordering, for example, you can say that every operation is ordered sequentially inside memory. This can make life harder for the hardware designer in implementing performance enhancement techniques like out of order execution and caches. And we're going to talk about that briefly. But let's, let's jump into this correctness problem. And these are all actual resource, research problems that are not that easy, uh, that are relevant to some people. OK, when could order affect correctness? And one of the key, key times is really when you're protecting shared data. So what I'm going to describe uh, really matters for people who are writing uh, libraries, for example, for uh, manipulating shared data. So if you're programming, Nicely, with a nicely written library, this may not affect you that much. But if you're programming with, uh, based on a library that's not written well, you may actually have problems. But we're going to talk about really uh, mm, the hardware support that's needed to write a good library that actually works. Uh, so threads are, uh, I mean, we've discussed shared data before. Threads are not allowed to update shared data collect, uh, concurrently for correctness purposes. This is mutual exclusion principle, right? Access to shared data are encapsulated inside critical sections, and they're protected via synchronization constructs, of which there are many uh, locks, semaphores, condition variables, which we're not going to talk about again. But the key is only one thread can execute a critical section at a given time. That's the mutual exclusion principle. And this is what the multiprocessor should really obey, right? The multiprocessor should provide the correct execution of synchronization primitives to enable the programmer to protect the shared data. Basically, it should support this mutual exclusion principle. So how do you support mutual exclusion? There is a software part of it, and there is a hardware part of it. The programmer first needs to make sure mutual exclusion is correctly implemented. We will assume this. The synchronization primitives don't have any bugs. But of course, this is a critically important topic also, and this is an old topic also. And if you haven't read this, I would recommend reading Dijkstra's uh, seminal work on cooperating sequential processes, which actually talked about how you should synchronize uh, between different threads. And he talked about Decker's algorithm. This is an algorithm he developed with one of his students, Decker, for mutual exclusion. We're going to look at a very simplified form of Decker's algorithm. I'm not going to claim that it's Decker's algorithm, but I have to simplify it so that we can reason about it. So basically, the programmer relies on hardware primitives to support correct synchronization. But if the hardware primitives are not correct, or if they're unpredictable for some reason, programmer's life is tough. If the hardware primitives are correct, but not easy to reason about, programmer's life is still tough. <laughs> so that's the key over here. And there's a huge amount of research that we can cover here. But we're going to start with the basics. 
So let's assume this basics. And we're going to assume this program is correct because I'm actually omitting uh, a lot of stuff over here. Basically, we have these two processes uh, that are executing, that are co communicating with each other. Uh, this processor is setting a bit f1 equals to 1 over here, indicating that it's going to enter the critical section, or it has entered the critical section. And it's checking if the other processor is in the critical section. If it's not, then it enters the critical section. At the end of the critical section, it sets this bit to 0, indicating that it's out of the critical section. And the other processor does the opposite. It sets this other bit, f2 equal to 1, indicating that it is in the critical section. It checks if the other processor is in the critical section. If not, it enters the critical section. At the end of the critical section, it sets its bit to 0, saying that, oh, I'm not in the critical section anymore, dot, dot, dot. And this else loop ensures that you go back somehow and ensure that you retry. And that's the part I'm going to ignore over here because there are a lot of algorithms that have been developed to make sure that that retry is efficient, dot, 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 right? That's the synchronization part of it. OK, basically, uh, we have two operations here in this processor, the operation A and the operation B that we're going to concern ourselves with. This processor needs to set F1 and check F2. This processor needs to set F2 and check F1. And for what the hardware needs to provide in the end is only one processor should be in the critical section at any given time, right? Not both. So assume P1 is in the critical section. P1 is this processor. Intuitively, it must have executed A, right? Because it's here. Which means F1 must be 1, because A happens before B in the sequential von Neumann order, which we're assuming for each processor which means that P2 should not enter the critical section, right? And if it does enter, then that's a problem. <laughs> so the question is, can the two processors be in the critical section at the same time, given that they both obey the von Neumann model, and we don't put any other constraint into the system? And the answer is yes. <laughs> well, I'll give you an example. You need to construct an example. Basically, these two processors are connected to the memory somehow. Well, let's give you the, this example over here. Uh, basically, we have these two processors, P1 and P2. And P1 is trying to set F1 so that it enters the critical section. And P2 is trying to set F2 so that it enters the critical section. And assume that it takes time for these guys to read memory, for these different processors to read memory. Let's say at time 0, P1 executes this operation A. Remember, operation A is setting the bit that says, I am in the critical section. Operation B is checking whether the other processor is in the critical section. From the processor 2's point of view, operation X is setting the bit that says, I am in the critical section. Operation Y is checking whether the other processor is in the critical section. OK, so I'm going to concoct an example. But it, it does happen in existing systems, actually. Uh, but P1 executes A, sets F1 to 1 and sends that update to memory, and assumes that it's done. Basically, P1 at this point, at time 0, says, I'm going to set F1 to 1, and I'm going to assume that this is complete. Done. P2 does the same thing. It executes X, which is setting F2 to 1, and assumes that it's done from its point of view. But it sends the update to memory. So P1's update is going through memory. It's going to update F1 at some point, set it to 1. P2's update is going through memory. It's going to go update F2 at some point, set this to 1. Let's assume that this is closer to P2 and this is closer to P1. So P1 actually can read F2 much faster than it can actually write to F1. And P2 can actually read F1 much faster than it can write to F2. So let's assume that P1's read of F2 takes 50 cycles, but P1's write to F1 takes 100 cycles, and vice versa. P2's read of F1 takes 50 cycles. P2's write to F2 takes 100 cycles. Let's look at what happens in the execution. So bear with me. This is what I said just now, earlier. So at time 1, processor 1 executes B. Basically, it, checks, it tries to check if F2 is equal to 0. It starts the load of F2. Right? Remember, F2 is close to it. It sends a load request to here. Processor 2, a store is going to F2 in the previous cycle. But it's going to take longer. It's going to reach F2 much earlier. Similarly, processor 2 execute, executes Y at time 1, it, which is testing 
whether the other processor is in the critical section, testing F1 is equal to zero, it starts a load of F1, and it's going to take some time, 50 cycles. It takes 50 cycles to access this memory, let's say. Okay, and processor's one update of F1 is still propagating over here. So basically, at time 50, memory sends back to processor one F2, saying, oh, F2 is zero, right? So F2 is zero, because processor two, even though it said F2, it didn't propagate over here yet. But memory already sent to processor one zero at that point. Similarly, processor two gets F1 equals to zero, because processor two accesses F1 in 50 cycles. And the update that was made by processor one to F2 didn't propagate. Right. So it takes 100 cycles to do this update. But this processor assumed that it was complete. OK, so basically, this processor, P1 loaded F2, that's equal to 0. And P2 loaded F1, which is equal to 0. And they both know, think that neither of the processors are in the critical section. So they both enter in the critical section at that point. Make sense? So if you go back to this code, what happened was this processor executed F1, assumed that it's done. This processor executed F2, assumed that it's done. It load, this processor loaded F2, and it got F2 before the update of this processor propagated into memory. This processor loaded F1, and it got F1 equals 0 before this update propagated into the memory. As a result, both of them think this, this processor thinks F2 is equal, equal to 0, and this processor thinks F1 is equal to 0, even though individually they both think, oh, F2 is equal to 1 over here, and F1 is equal to 1. But they both entered the critical section at that point in time. And at that point, it, nothing matters, actually. Both of them violated the mutual exclusion principle at this point. And at time 100, memory completes the operation A that was sent. F1 becomes 1, but it's too late. And F2 becomes 1, but it's also too late because propagation happened much later. So this is an example that could happen perfectly in a system that looks like this. There may be other reasons. Contention, for example, in the network. If your network doesn't preserve ordering, all of those things happen, actually. But in this case, if you look at this, both of these processors executed in von Neumann order. Right? There was no out-of-order execution within each processor. They both did the operations in von Neumann order, von Neumann order here. What was different is the memory actually saw different orders. So let's see what happened over here. Basically, processor one's view of memory operations looked like, looks like this. It executes A, which is setting F1 to 1. It executes B, which is testing F2, whether it's equal to 0. And then it sees X. F2 is set to 1, right? Because this propagated to memory at cycle 100, right? Memory completes X at this point, assuming it read the X at that point, right? Processor 2's view is very different. It assumed that X is completed at the time it wrote to F2, and then it tested F1 equal to 0. Why? And then later, only at 100 cycles, if it did a read at that point, it saw A, right? Basically, from this point of view, from this processor's point of view, A happened before X, or A appeared to happen before X. From this processor's point of view, X appeared to happen before A. And clearly, that's a logical inconsistency. You cannot while, it cannot happen at the same time, right? It has to be only one way. So basically, these two processors did not see the same order of operations in memory. They assumed a different order. And from each processor's point of view, it was a correct order. If, if you only assume von Neumann model of execution. So you need something else to ensure that these processors operate correctly in the, order, uh, in the presence of this sort of synchronization. So this is the real problem. The processor did not see the same order of operations to memory. And as a result, the happened before relationship between multiple updates to memory was inconsistent between the two processors' point of view, as I just said. As a result, each processor thought the other was not in the critical section. And as a result, you get incorrect results. And this should not happen because the programmer relies on correct 
mutual exclusion support, right? Any kind of synchronization primitive is broken if this is the case. So how can we solve the problem? Basically, the, that's the key idea of sequential consistency, the paper that you're reading, two pages, that is, describes the exact same problem that I described. Actually, the example is taken from that paper also. Uh, the idea is very simple. All processors see the same order of operations to memory, a single global order. And everybody is on the same page. As a result, you don't get this inconsistency in the happened before relationship from different points of view, because everybody has the same point of view. In other words, all memory operations happen in order or are reported to happen in the same order. Right? This is called the global total order that is consistent across all processors. The assumption is that within this global order, each processor's operations appear in sequential order with respect to its own operations. So that's the von Neumann part of it. OK, that's the uh, paper that you're reading. Basically, the paper formally defines uh, sequential consistency as a multiprocessor system is sequentially consistent if the result of any execution is the same as if the operations of all the processors were executed in some sequential order, and the operations of in each individual processor appear in the sequence in the order specified by its program. This is the von Neumann part, and this is the global total order part. Everybody sees a single global total order. It could be any global total order, as long as it's the same order. So there are many, many acceptable orders, actually, and we will see that. And this is called a memory ordering model. It's also called a memory model, but memory model is too general. It's really a memory ordering model, and it's specified by the ISA. So x86, for example, has some model, which has changed over the years. Alpha has some model. Different, uh, different uh, processors have the model also. Actually, this is even bigger than this. Uh, like a lot of things we've, we've been seeing, this model really affects the programming model, right? And programming models everywhere. So if you're doing distributed systems programming, you run into a very similar issue. You run into consistency in the global scale. And the same issue exists over there, right? This data center is executing something. This other data center is executing something. How do you ensure consistency? Exactly the same issue happens. And people have developed consistency models. Some people call it eventual consistency. Eventually, things will be consistent, for example, but we're not going to go into that. Similar issue, again, programmer interface. Programmer, programming language interface. Languages also have this model. Languages need to provide something to the programmer such that the programmer can reason about how the operations will be executed by the compiler, for example. We're not covering that, but very similar issues exist there. We're looking at the bottom of the stack, the hardware. What does the hardware provide? But similar consistency issues arise at different levels of the stack. OK, so this is the programmer's abstraction, basically. You can think of memory as a switch that services one load or store at a time from any processor, only one. All processors see the currently serviced load or store at the same time, and each processor's operations are serviced in program order. Now, if you satisfy this, you've satisfied sequential consistency, and you don't get to the problem that we've discussed, incorrectness problem that we've discussed earlier. Now, clearly, if you implement it this way, you get rid of all the parallelism in memory, right? All of the bank level parallelism is gone. All of the channel level parallelism is gone. <laughs> Your basic, all of the optimizations that we've talked about are gone. <laughs> so clearly, people are not implementing it this way. This is really an abstraction to the, provided to the programmer. Programmer sees this order, but underneath, things are executed in very, very different orders. OK, but let's take a look at this sequentially consistent operation orders. So in the example that we've shown, there are a bunch of potentially correct global orders. And all are correct. These are the different operations. Remember, A is setting F1 to 1. B is checking whether F2 is equal to 0. X is setting F2 to 1. Y is checking F2, F1 is equal to 0. Execute by processor 1, processor 2. And they're all sequentially consistent orders. As long as all processors see the same order. And remember, the von Neumann order within each processor needs to be maintained. So you can actually enumerate all possible orders. In this case, I think there are only six. If you find one more, let me know. I don't think there are. <laughs> OK. So which order? This is also called an interleaving of memory operations. Which interleaving is observed depends on the implementation and the dynamic latencies. Uh, so there are two corollaries to this. First, within the same execution, when you're executing, all processors see the same global order of operations to memory. So correctness is preserved, basically. We've solved the correctness problem, which is good. Now the programmer can write correct parallel programs. 
And because it satisfies the happened before intuition. So it's very intuitive. Well, if you break this, I don't know what happens. <laughs> Actually, a lot of these issues arise in distributed systems. This uh, happened before relationships were developed for distributed systems. Lamport later actually developed uh, Lamport clocks, for example, to ensure that happened before relationship uh, holds in a distributed system. But we're not going to go into that. If you, if you take distributed systems classes, you will see this happened before relationship a lot. Has anybody taken distributed systems classes? Well, you know about this probably. OK, good. So one problem we have not solved is across different executions, different global orders can be observed. And each of them are sequentially consistent. They're all correct orders. But debugging is still difficult. Well, debugging of this one may be easy. You can dump the state, and you can see what happened in this particular execution. But if you want to replicate the problem, you may not be able to, because you may get a different order the next time you run the program. Right? So part of the debugging problem is alleviated because of this also. But part of the debugging problem still remains. And this is one reason some of the bugs happen. Uh, some of the bug, bugs become observable. Some of the bugs don't become observable. right? Because once you run the program, you get a crash. Many, many times you run the program, you get different interleavings, and the program doesn't crash. Right? If you have a multi-threaded application, that's very common. That's why it's hard to replicate bugs that you have in multi-threaded programs because of the second one today. The first one is hopefully a given today. OK? So how do you solve the second problem is actually tougher. People have proposed deterministic replay mechanisms, for example. If you actually have a given interleaving, you record that interleaving during an execution. And if you're debugging the program with the same input next time, you replay deterministically with the same interleaving. And good debuggers would provide that support. That's a lot of overhead to provide that support, because you need to record the interleavings that you see. Right? Or you enforce a given interleaving during an execution, deterministic order. But that's also very tough, because now, how do you start with that deterministic order? Right? How do you actually start uh, with defining that? So you can actually punt to the programming language. And programming language says it should be executed in this order. But that could lead to a lot of inefficiency in execution. Because maybe the dynamic order should be much more efficient, right? You should not obey the order that's specified by the programming language or the compiler. OK, we're not going to talk about this as much. But you can think about it. So there are a bunch of issues with sequential consistency. It's really a nice abstraction for programming. That's why the Lamport's 1979 paper is actually a beautiful paper. That's why you're reading it. But there are two issues. One issue is it has two conservative ordering requirements. Right? And people have tried to attack this uh, over the course of decades. Which means that because it's too concerted, it limits the aggressiveness of performance enhancement techniques. So the first question I'll ask is, is the total global order requirement too strong? So every processor sees the same load store order every time. And the answer is, anybody? Depends. That's a good, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, actually, it depends. It depends on who, where you're applying this order. That's right, yes. <laughs> But if it's actually applied across all of the loads and stores in a program, it's actually too strong. <laughs> Basically, do we need a global order across all operations and all processors? Uh, how about a global order only across all stores, for example? Why do we care about loads? In fact, it turns out uh, this is a much simpler way of designing. And this is closer to x86's model. There's a model called total store ordering model. You get the total store order across the processors, but not load order. You need to make it work, of course, in the presence of load reordering inside the processor, but we're not going to go into that. Basically, yeah, unique store order memory model. Spark used to have this also. Or how about enforcing? That doesn't look right, right? How about A enforcing? How about enforcing a global order only at the synchronization boundaries? OK, I cannot see this. OK, that's better. <laughs> How about doing it only at the synchronization boundaries? Because does it really matter when the processors are not communicating? It doesn't matter, right? And that actually makes sense. Because if you're touching some private data, who cares who else is observing that? So that's a big realization also over here. Why not enforce order only at the boundaries of synchronization, whenever you're touching shared locks, shared data? And this leads to relaxed memory models. They're called relaxed memory models because 
They're relaxing this global, total global order to only a local order, if you will. And this is actually, for example, acquire release consistency model is an example of this. One of the papers, Kurosh Garachulu's paper, uh, introduces that, uh, but I'm not going to go into that except for one slide maybe. Okay, so performance enhancement techniques that could make, uh, there are actually some performance enhancement techniques uh, that make sequential consistency implementation difficult. So how do, how do you do out-of-order execution in the presence of this, for example? Uh, for example, loads happen out-of-order with respect to each other and with respect to independent stores. If this happens in a processor, this makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order of all memory operations. Right? Because you're actually sending the loads and stores in a very different order. So think about this. I'm, we're not going to go into the details of this. Uh, there are solutions to it, but solutions actually boil down to reordering things, potentially. Caching, a memory location is now present in multiple places. And this prevents the effect of a store to be seen by other processors. Right? You've cached this location, and you're storing to it. That's not even going to some other bus, for example. So if you go back to this abstraction, abstraction is not how things are implemented, but this is a really good way of thinking about it. You've cached this location, you're operating on it. The store is not even visible over here, and that's one of the benefits of caching. Right? You don't expose your loads and stores to somebody else. You say bandwidth. Now, do you have to expose everything over here? So you're back to square one. Maybe not square one. You can exploit locality, but uh, band bandwidth is increasing. Basically, this makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order of all memory operations unless you expose everything to the memory obeying that abstraction. But then that, that actually uh, gets rid of a lot of these optimizations. So there's clearly a tension between these two optimizations and memory seeing all of the operations uh, from all processors and ensuring a consistent order for all processors. But existing systems actually, that's why sequential consistency is hard to implement because at some point you'll need to ensure the same order. That's why people went to these different models over here. Maybe we get rid of the loads, we have a total store order model. Maybe we don't do it for all operations. We do it just for the synchronization operations. And we can keep the benefits of auto order execution and caching as much as possible. So weaker memory consistency is essentially what I just said. Don't do it uh, for all operations. But the uh, realization is that the ordering of operations is important only when the order affects the operations on shared data. Basically, when this processor needs to synchronize to execute a program region. So weak consistency says programmer specifies the regions in which memory operations do not need to be ordered, or vice versa. Or the compiler does this. If the programmer is programming nicely with the libraries, then the compiler can figure this out, right? If the programmer is not programming nicely, it's doing its, his or her own synchronization, then it's his or her, her job to do this, right? That's why I said programmer. It's some programmer. It's either the programmer who is doing the synchronization by themselves, or the library programmer who needs to get this right for everybody who's using the right library. So how do you actually delineate those regions? This is the reason for the memory fence instructions that we have in a lot of the ISAs today. All of the ISAs have some sort of memory fence or memory barrier. Basically, when you get to a memory barrier, all memory operations before sense must complete before the fence is executed, and they become visible. And all memory operations after the fence must wait for the fence to complete. So if you insert a fence after every operation, you ensure that that operation becomes visible to everyone else. Right? That's one way of doing it. That's the simplest way people add it to the ISAs today to support weaker memory consistency models. But there could be other ways, actually. And fence is complete in program order, <laughs> of course. Right? And all synchronization operations act like a fence. Or you, ex you insert explicit fences after each operation. So that's one way of implementing weak consistency. Clearly, this puts back some burden on the programmer now, right? Sequential consistency is nice because the, there is no burden on the programmer other than getting the synchronization itself correct. But the burden is on the hardware designer, and hardware designer now has a problem making sure that you get high performance, and these are very widely known techniques. They go against sequential consistency. But now, 
maybe you can implement some of those techniques easily, but now you punt back a little bit on the programmer. And the, uh, the paper by Koresh Gareshurlu that talks about weak consistency models uh, beautifully outlines this, actually. They, they designed a compiler to actually insert these fence operations. I believe they actually inserted it by hand at that point in time. Okay. Any questions? Yes. So uh, that's true, actually. Yeah, it, 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 as, um, as long as the processors see the same order, that's fine, yes. Maybe complete is too strong over here. As long as the... Uh, Yeah, they don't. Uh, underneath, <laughs> uh, you guarantee that it completes at some point, of course, but you may report it to have completed as long as you know that that guarantee is done. So you can actually still play games underneath. <laughs> but you need to be very careful, of course. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about trade offs over here. Weaker consistency compared to sequential consistency. Cle clearly, there is no need to guarantee a very strict order of memory operations anymore with weaker consistency models. So that's nice. This enables the hardware implementation of performance enhancement techniques to be simpler. I'm not saying it's possible because it's really possible with sequential consistency also, but with overhead. Uh, and this can be higher performance than stricter ordering because you do, you do this ordering only, when, uh, only in uh, these uh, critical sections, if you will. The disadvantage is there is more burden on the programmer or software, so you need to get the fences or these synchronization points correct. So if you miss one, then you're back to the problem that we've discussed, right? Two processors can be in the same critical section again. And this is another example of the programmer microarchitect trade-off uh, that we've been covering in this course. OK, there's an example question, which I'm not going to solve, but I'm going to show you uh, what an example question might be looking like. So this was a question from a past exam, as you can see, spring 2013. You can find the solutions also, and this will be on a homework assignment. So for example, one question related to this could be, and this also gives you an idea of what I expect you to know. Uh, for example, you should know sequential consistency. Uh, that's, I don't consider that memorization, <laughs> because that's a concept that's really fundamental. Uh, so I'm not going to define sequential consistency, for example, in an exam. But I can ask, two threads are concurrently running on a dual-core processor that implements a sequentially consistent memory model. Assume that the value at address 1000 is initialized to 0, and thread A is executing this, thread B is executing this, stores and loads, a bunch of them. List all possible values that can be stored in R3 after both threads have finished executing. That's pretty simple, actually, right? If you go through this, relatively easy to do. And then after both threads have finished executing, you find that the values of R1 through R4 are this. How many different instruction interleavings of the two threads produce this result? Now you have to do some reverse engineering to figure this out. Not that hard, though. What is the number of, total number of all possible instruction interleavings? You need to think a little bit over here. <laughs> this is essentially what we did, but you need to do it with more number of things over here. And I'm not really interested in number crunching, really. You can just write in an open form. <laughs> and on a non-sequentially consistent processor, is the total number of all possible instruction interleavings less than, equal to, or greater than your answer to question C? Now you need to think about non-sequentially consistent processors. Anyway, you can, this is going to be a homework question, so you'll have fun thinking about this. Has anybody solved it now? <laughs> That's OK. Yeah, you, this requires some thinking. OK. Any questions? So I'm, uh, there, there could be more that could be uh, talked about over here. Actually, uh, one of the things that simplifies programmers' life is a natural concept is what you discussed earlier, transactional memory. Well, why are we dealing with all this? Why doesn't the programmer provide these critical sections in terms of transactions? The programmer says, this part of the code is transactional. This is the beginning of the transaction. This is the end of the transaction. And that's all I'm going to provide. Somebody deal with the synchronization for me. That's uh, one way of actually making programmers' life easier. But how do you do that transaction internally? So transaction essentially is 
either you execute all of the transactional parts or none of it, right? Atomic, as we've seen earlier. That's, that's one of the reasons I showed that earlier. So programming persistent memory actually has similarities to programming synchronization. There are some differences which we're not going to go into. But you can have a transactional programming model for both of them. And somebody needs to provide that illusion of atomicity uh, to the programmer. And that comes after these consistency coherence models. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that, but keep that in mind. No questions? Otherwise, I'm going to jump into caching and consistency. Uh, coherence, sorry. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me actually start this a little bit, and then we can take a break. So caching not only complicates ordering of all operations. As we've seen, caching prevents some of the operations to be seen by, other, by the memory, right? As a result, it complicates the ordering of all operations. A memory allocation can be present in multiple caches also. Uh, and uh, this prevents the effect of a store or load to be seen by other processors. This makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order of all memory operations. So that, that part we've seen. But it also complicates ordering of operations on a single memory location. And we're going to concern ourselves with this single memory location for the rest of this lecture. A single memory location can be present in multiple caches. And this makes it difficult for processors that have cached the same location to have the correct value of that location. This is different from this global ordering. It's really about the updates that you have for this particular location. You may get this correct, but this global ordering incorrect, and vice versa. OK, so we're going to talk about cache coherence. But I think before we move into cache coherence, we should probably take a six-minute break. OK. Maybe it's time to restart. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to finish cache coherence. It's such, a, such an extensive topic. But let's see how much dent we can make. <laughs> Hopefully, this is still fun. You're all alert? Yeah, I see a lot of alert faces. That's good. <laughs> OK, uh, we're going to talk about another fascinating topic. There's been a lot of research done in all of the areas that we've been talking about. But there's all, I think there's a big need for new, fresh ideas. So outsiders who are coming in can provide the fresh ideas, I think. You don't want to be doing the same old, same old. <laughs> OK, some readings. Well, actually, uh, this one is perhaps the more required one over here. But if you're interested in brushing up on or learning more, you can read these. Uh, these are the two seminal pa papers, I would say. Maybe this third one, actually, the three of these. This talks about the directory-based coherence, which was developed earlier than the MESI coherence protocol, which are really orthogonal to each other, actually. But this is assuming a bus-based Snoopy coherence protocol. And this is another bus-based Snoopy coherence protocol. And there are a bunch of other coherence papers over here that are interesting. OK, basically, we're going to deal with the shared uh, memory model. Many parallel programs communicate through shared memory. Processor 0 writes to an address, followed by processor 1 reading. And they communicate with each other somehow. And each should receive the value written by uh, last value written by anyone. And that requires synchronization. Clearly, synchronization, what does last written mean, right? What if mem uh, memory uh, location A is cached at either end? You should be printing the correct value, right? If this is updating its cache, you should not be printing the value that's not updated over here. And we've seen this before, as I said. If multiple processors cache the same block, how do they ensure they all see a consistent state? Should crash, uh, we should uh, change that to a coherent state, because we've already seen consistency is abused or used for something else, as we've seen. Right. Memory consistency is really about all global ordering, or memory ordering for all locations. Coherence is about coherence of a single location. As we've looked at before, if this processor, both processors load X into their caches, when one processor writes to X, and this processor again loads X into uh, a register, it should not get the stale value. Right? It should get the new value. And we've discussed whose responsibility should it be. I'm not going to go over this in detail. Can the programmer ensure coherence if caches are invisible to software? It's possible, but it comes with a lot of overhead. And we've discussed some of these instructions. What if the ISA provides a flush local, flush global, flush cache instruction, dot, dot, dot. 
There's actually another way. You could actually punt to the operating system, and you can say, whenever I'm modifying a location, I'm going to protect this page. Right? And no other processor process can touch that location, or no other thread can touch that location. That's very high overhead. Right? Whenever some other processor needs that location, now they need to get the access permissions, and a lot of overhead comes into play. That way, you can actually ensure coherence at the software level. But at what cost is a question. So as we discussed, hardware coherence simplifies software jobs. One idea is to invalidate all other copies of block A when, the, uh, when a processor writes to it. Right? And we've seen this simple coherence scheme. I didn't call it VI at that time, but I called this protocol VI, valid invalid coherence protocol. And it makes some assumptions. You have a write through, no write to allocate cache. And whenever you write to uh, a location, you send a bus write signal, which means that whenever a processor receives a bus write signal for that cache block, it goes to the invalid state. Right. And you stay in the invalid state because you're a write through cache and you don't allocate on a write, as you can see. If you were in the invalid state, you stay in the invalid state. But if you're in the valid state, and if you read from that location, that's fine. Uh, but if you write to that location, you send an invalidate request, bus write request on the bus, such that another processor that sees the bus write to that cache block, it goes from valid to invalid. Right. And of course, if a processor gets, this, the state machine is not complete, as you can see. If a processor gets, oh, uh, no, it's not complete, I think. Oh, yeah, it is complete. If a processor gets bus write signal over here, it, uh, it stays in the invalid state. No, it's not complete. It's not specified well. Anyway, basically, if you get a bus write signal in the invalid state, you stay in the invalid state clearly, right? Because you don't have the block in your cache. But basically, this is a Snoopy cache coherence protocol. Caches snoop or observe each other's write and read operations. If a processor writes to a block, all others invalidate the block. And this is one specification of this protocol. So there are actions of the local processor on the cache block, processor read, processor write, and they trigger actions that are broadcast on the bus for the block, bus read and bus write. So we're going to see more complicated protocols soon. So we'll, let's talk about non-solutions to the cache coherence first, because these non-solutions exist. Basically, first is non-hardware-based coherence. Keeping caches coherent is software's responsibility. This makes microarchitects' life easier, clearly, but makes average programmers' life much harder. And again, processors that did not provide cache coherence didn't fare well in the market. IBM cell processor is one example, as we've discussed even though it had a lot of innovative ideas and was a powerful processor. So you need to worry about hardware caches to maintain program correctness. Not a good idea. And there's also overhead in ensuring co coherence in software. For example, what I discussed earlier. You protect the page, and you have page-based software coherence. That is a lot of overhead. You trap into the operating system whenever you try to modify a page. Right. The other non-solution non is all caches are shared between all processors. Which means that the data is not replicated, so there is no coherence problem to begin with. Uh, clearly, this gets rid of the coherence problem, but it's a non-solution because it's not a problem to begin with. Uh, so shared cache becomes a bandwidth bottleneck in this case, also the latency bottleneck. And it's very hard to design a scalable system with low latency cache access this way. Right? You want to have many, many, a million processors in the system. How do you share all the caches? That's not going to work. OK. So uh, basically, if you want to maintain coherence, you need to guarantee that all processors see a consistent value, i.e. consistent updates for the same memory location. Writes to location A by processor 1 should be seen by P1, and all writes to A should appear in some order. So it requires two things. It requires write propagation. You need to guarantee that updates will propagate. And you need to serialize the writes to a given location. You need to provide a consistent order seen by all processors for the same memory location. And all coherence protocols need to guarantee this. And for this, you need a global point of serialization for the store ordering. These are the ordering for the updates, basically. But this is, again, for a given location, not for all locations, all updates. This is just for a given location. And you need to serialize those. So let's see different coherence protocols, how they do it. So the basic idea of hardware cache coherence is a processor or cache. I'm going to use these interchangeably, because we're really talking about a private cache over here. It broadcasts its writes and updates to a memory location to all other processors. That's a broadcast-based protocol. Another cache that has a location either updates or invalidates its copy. 
So I can certainly uh, send the data along with the address if you want other processors to update. Or you can have an invalidation-based protocol that just sends the address saying, I'm going to write to this location, invalidate all of the other copies in the system. Okay. So clearly, the first trade-off is what I just discussed, right? Do you update or do you invalidate? Whenever you write to a location, do other processors update their values or do they invalidate their locally cached values? So the first one is an update protocol. You push an update to all copies in the system. And the second one is invalidation. And sure, there is only one copy, local and updated. So let's look at both. So on a read, if local copy is invalid, you put out the request. If another node has a copy, it returns the copy. Otherwise, the memory does. And on a write, you read the block into the cache as before. If you have an update protocol, you write to the block and simultaneously broadcast written data and address to all of the other nodes. And the ones that, are, that have the block cached in their caches, they take the value and place it into their caches. Yeah, that's what I just said. If the block is present, other nodes update the data in their caches. Now, it helps if you have all the processors connected to a single shared interconnect, right? Bus, for example. Invalidate protocol, you write to the block and simultaneously broadcast invalidation of the address, only the address, to all of the other processors. And the ones, other nodes that have uh, the block cached in their caches invalidate the block. This way, only a single processor in the system has ensured that it has the block, now it can write to it. Yes? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, you need to have some sort of interconnect between them to be able to do this. There's no other way. Well, uh, you, you need to have some data path anyway, right? So the question is, do you broadcast the data to everyone or not? So th the path should already exist somewhere because you need to update the data out to memory, and all those, need, all those caches need to get the data from somewhere. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a lot of issues. We're going to cover them. <laughs> We're going to cover some of them, certainly. So if you have a simultaneous updates, then if you have a single shared medium, you have a serialization point. So that was one of the requirements, right? You need to serialize the updates to the same block. But if you have simultaneous updates to two different blocks, yes, now how do you do them in parallel? Now that's limited by your interconnect. That's why the next lecture is going to be on interconnects, because there is a very tight coupling between how good your interconnect is and how much performance you can get from a multiprocessor. So you're touching very good issues over here. OK, so which one do you want, update versus invalidate? Clearly, there are some trade-offs over here, right? Uh, and it depends on the program behavior. This is where it depends a good answer. Uh, write frequency and sharing behavior are critical. For example, if, if you have a share set that's constant and updates are very infrequent, uh, if you have an update-based protocol, you write to the location and you also send it to all of the other shares, and if all of them are going to read that location, for example, if you have producer-consumer communication between them, you may want an update protocol that automatically updates all of the shares, right? And that, that way you broadcast to everyone. So this basically gets rid of the invalidations. So you're, you're writing to this location, and another uh, processor actually is going to read from that location later on. If you actually, when you write it, if you invalidate that location, this processor needs to send a request to get it afterwards. That takes time. But when you write to it, if you update the cache of the other processor, if the coherence protocol automatically does it, when this processor needs to read it, it already has it in its cache. Right? So you reduce the access latency for other processors depending on the sharing patterns. Right? But if you actually update the data many, many times, without any intervening reads by other cores, then all of the updates that you made to the other caches are useless. So it really depends on read and write patterns that you have in the program. This processor A may be doing 1,000 writes to the same cache block. Do you really want to do all of the updates to all of the other caches in the system? Maybe you just do one write, invalidate everyone else, and then do 999 local writes to that block 
and no one gets informed about those. Right? That's a place where you really want invalidate based protocol. Okay, so one of the other issues with an update protocol is it's essentially a write through cache at that point, right? And your bus can become the bottleneck. Okay, so invalidate based protocol, after you broadcast an invalidation to all of the other cores, the core actually can have exclusive access rights to that block, right? Because assuming the protocol is correctly implemented, you know that this core is the only one that has the block in its cache. Everybody else is invalidated, which means that it doesn't need to inform anyone about what it does to that block. That's essentially what I said with the 999 updates in the previous example. Only cores that keep reading after each write retain a copy. This could be good for caching also, actually, because you've invalidated uh, the copies. So if a core is not going to read the block, it doesn't get the update. Makes sense. But if contention is high, uh, this invalidation can lead to a lot of ping-ponging, basically a lot of invalidation and re reacquire. Right? For example, if you have a really contended lock, for example, uh, if you may actually be invalidating from all of the other processors. But if you actually updated them, after you wrote to the lock, the other processor would have gotten the latest value of the lock, and it would quickly check what the value is, and it could actually enter the critical section right away, right? as opposed to doing another read, and when it does the write, it says another invalidate, dot, dot, dot. So ping-ponging actually at mul happens at multiple levels, but this is one example of it. So this may actually cause a lot of invalidations. Uh, if you have producer-consumer type of parallelism, you're going to write to one location, and somebody else is going to read from it. Of course, you can try to optimize this even more, right? As we've discussed earlier, people have tried to, whenever you do an update to a shared data or shared lock, they've tried to predict which other processor should get that update. Right? You can only update the processor that needs that data. You could push that over there. And there have been a lot of optimizations, but this is really two ends of the continuum over here. OK, so we'll talk about two cache coherence methods. Uh, not necessarily protocols, but these are methods. How do you ensure that proper caches are updated? One is a Snoopy bus, as we've discussed. You have a single shared bus across all processors. And that provides a single point of serialization for all memory requests. Not, all, not a single location, but all locations over here. So this is actually good for consistency as well, actually, if you want to do memory consistency. But we're going to ignore consistency here. And processors observe other processors' actions on this bus. For example, if processor 1 makes a read-exclusive request, I'm going to call a write request as read-exclusive. I'm going to read this block such that it's the exclusive copy that I will have, and I can do whatever to it after that. If processor 1 makes that request for a block A on the bus, processor 0 sees and invalidates its own copy of A, or updates. So the protocol is really different from uh, the method. Method can be Snoopy bus, and then you can have a valid invalid protocol or some other protocol that we're going to discuss, or an update-based protocol or invalidate-based protocol, dot, dot, dot. The directory-based protocol uh, is inherently a bit more scalable, but you really have a single point of serialization per block distributed among nodes. So you have a directory. Uh, Let's assume that it's not distributed. Let's assume that you have a single shared place that keeps track of all the blocks in the system. And a processor, when it wants to do something to a block, it sends a request to the directory. Directory, please give me this block. I want to read it. And the directory keeps track of which caches have each block. And it coordinates invalidation and updates. Right. If you think about it, this is a middleman that distributes the blocks to the different cores, whereas here, Snoopy bus implicitly serve as a serialization point. But if you have this directory, let's assume you have a single shared directory at a single place, all of the requests go through the directory, so you have a point of synchronization. But now you can actually scale this. You can actually have a partition directory across 1,000 processors, right? Memory requests that are going to address space portion 0 through n goes to this directory memory, uh, to, to get the permissions, coherence permissions. Memory requests go, uh, going to addresses n through 2, 2 n, n plus 1 to 2 n, go to this node, dot, dot, dot. Basically, you can partition the directory. Whereas this one, how do you do that? Well, this is assuming a single point of serialization. It's assuming a bus. 
So inherently, a directory-based protocol is more scalable. So we're going to look at the trade-offs between them uh, toward the end after we cover examples. So for example, in a directory-based protocol, processor one asks the directory for an exclusive copy as opposed to sending a read exclusive request on the bus that everybody else sees. The directory asks processor zero, which has that block A, to invalidate its copy because it's going to grant that copy to processor one. The directory waits for an acknowledgment, ensuring that processor zero invalidated the copy, and then gives the permission to processor one. Makes sense, right? <laughs> OK, so let's look at directory-based cache coherence in a little bit more detail. It's a very simple idea, basically. You have, let's assume that you have a logically central directory that keeps track of where the copies of each cache block reside. And caches, or processors, consult this directory to ensure coherence. One example mechanism, people have optimized this a lot also, but assume that you have P processors. For each cache block in memory, you can store P plus one bits in the directory. One bit for each cache, indicating whether the block is in that particular processor's cache. And one other bit, saying exclusive bit, indicates that a cache has the only copy of the block and can update it without notifying others. So if the exclusive bit, the plus one over here, is set, only one of the p bits, or exactly one of the p bits, should be set. Right. Exclusive bit may not be set. But again, exactly one of the p bits may be set. That means that the processor has access, but not exclusive access to that block. OK. So on a read, you set the cache as bits and arrange the supply of data. Somebody needs to supply the data to the cache, and we're going to see methods of doing that. Uh, on a write, uh, the directory invalidates all the caches that have the block and reset their bits. And we have an exclusive bit associated with each block in the cache. So you don't, you sh uh, the directory has p plus 1 bits, that's the plus 1 bit, but the cache itself also needs to know that it has exclusive access to that data, right? It cannot assume exclusive access. Somebody needs to grant that exclusive access, but once it has the exclusive access, it needs to mark the block specially, saying that, oh, I have exclusive access to this block, I can do whatever I want without consulting the directory. Until the directory asks, I want your block, so you don't have exclusive access anymore. OK, so the directory is really the coordinator. Basically, if the cache has exclusive access to that block, it can update the exclusive, that block silently without informing the directory. And this is actually very important because of the sharing patterns. You can actually update the block many, many times without anyone requesting the block, right? OK, this is, again, my pictorial example over here. <laughs> p plus 1, p equals 4 in this case. This is an example directory-based scheme, basically. For a given block, for block A, for example, you have four bits, one bit for each processor, and you have an exclusive bit. And this sits at the memory controller. Let's assume that it's in the memory controller in a centralized place. In this case, you know that no cache has block A. Right? Let's assume P1 takes a read miss. It sends a read request to the directory for block A. And the directory takes the data from the memory controller, sends it to the P1, and marks P1's bit as 1 saying P1 has the block, no one else has it. P1 doesn't have it in exclusive state. So if a P1 wants to write to that block, it requires another request to the directory saying, I want to write to this block. Right. So P3, uh, let's assume that after this, the next action is P3, processor 3 takes a read miss to the same block. The directory consults uh, the bit vector. It says, oh, uh, I have the copy of the block in the memory. Processor one also has the copy, but they're consistent. They're coherent, basically. So I can take my copy and send it to processor 3 and mark processor 3's bit to 1. Now processor 3 and processor 1 both have the block, and it's the same as the block in the memory because no one has exclusive access. Now I just described one potential implementation, right? The directory could say, oh, I'm not going to take the copy from memory. It takes too long to access memory. I'm going to tell processor 1 to send processor 3 this block. Because I know, I know that processor 1 is really close to processor 3. And that cache-to-cache -cache communication is very quick. And I'm going to coordinate that communication. So that's certainly possible. That's another implementation of how do you communicate the data. Right. OK, let's keep going. Oh. OK, so the next action is processor 2 takes a write miss. 
Write miss meaning uh, basically processor 2 wants to write to this block, block A. The blo uh, it sends a request to the directory saying, I want to write to this block. That's essentially a read exclusive request. I want to read this block exclusively so that I can write to it. You could call the write request also, but it's usually called a read exclusive request. You want to read the block in an exclusive manner such that you can write to it. So directory looks at the state. Oh, it sees processor 1 and processor 3 have the block. So what the directory does first is it invalidates processor 1 and processor 3's caches. It sends invalidation signals to both of them. It waits for acknowledgment. Once it gets the acknowledgment, it knows that no other processor cache uh, has the block. So all of them become really zeros, but it may transition, of course, quickly. And then, uh, basically, it sets processor 2's bit to 1, and it sets the exclusive bit to 1, saying processor 2 is going to write to this block, and sends a grant request saying, processor 2, now you can write to this block, and by the way, here's the block. Right. So it sends the block as well as the grant to processor 2. Now the processor 2 can update the block without notifying any other processor or the directory because it has the block exclusively set. Inside its cache, it marks the block as exclusive and can keep writing to that block and reading from that block. It doesn't need to inform anyone. And processor 2, well, I guess I already said this, you have a private, it's also called a private bit or exclusive bit per cache block. Now let's say processor 3 wants to write to this block, same block, and the block is in this state. You have the same issue, basically. Uh, in this case, it's a little bit different, actually, uh, because here, the, pro the directory had the copy of the data, so it could supply it to processor 2 because it, the directory had the up-to-date copy. Here, in this case, when processor 3 wants to write to this block and the block is in this state, the directory, the memory controller, doesn't have the up-to-date copy, so what the directory needs to first do is to get the up-to-date copy. Well, there are optimization points over here. But basically, the directory sends a message uh, to processor 2 saying somebody else wants to write to that block, so invalidate that block in your cache. And give me the block, by the way. But there's an optimization here. Maybe it doesn't really need the block, right? Maybe it can tell uh, the, uh, the processor, invalidate your block, but uh, by the way, send the block to this other processor who actually wants the block. That's an optimization that you should really carefully do because there are acknowledgments. Maybe you get, you get into an inconsistent state, right? Okay, but let's assume that you get the block also uh, for whatever reason. And then once it gets the block and once it ensures that the uh, block is invalidated in processor 2's cache, then pro it's, it grants processor 3 uh, exclusive access because processor 3 wanted an exclusive access and it supplies the block to processor 3. Okay? Now this is update. Now processor 2 takes a read miss. At this point, what the directory does is gets that read request, and then it's, you need to think about what, is, what needs to be done. I didn't write it over here. But at this point, you could do many things. One thing you could potentially do is you could say processor, you could send a message to processor 3. You know that processor 3 is in exclusive mode. Send a message to the processor 3 saying that, oh, don't be in exclusive mode anymore. You can keep the data. Don't invalidate it. Somebody's going to read it. Give me the data. You get the data. And then the, uh, the directory sends the data to processor 2 who wants to read it. So it sets the bit, but it's not an exclusive in any of the caches. So it's now shared across different processors. So the directory is really the coordinator. And this is a very simple protocol, as you've seen over here. But even this very simple protocol enables or requires, perhaps, many, many optimizations. OK. And this is probably a good place to stop. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Yeah, yeah, so those are, so you're thinking about a Snoopy protocol, right? Bus-based protocol, not a directory-based protocol. Uh, because if you have a directory-based protocol, that becomes a bit simpler because you have a single point over here. But in a bus-based protocol, yes, you need to uh, take care of all those race conditions. That's essentially a race condition. Uh, 
And you need to guarantee coherence in the presence of these actions. While you're propagating uh, your information on the bus, somebody else might be doing something. And you need to ensure that those things are consistent. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the difficulty of it, essentially. That's the difficulty of designing a cache coherence protocol. No, no, these are, these are fully implemented in existing systems. <laughs> but people need, you do need to handle in the hardware design all of those pot potential race conditions. And that's why it's a difficult part of the design. Yes? Well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can try to optimize this protocol in many ways. Sure, try to customize to the access patterns that you may potentially see. But th that complicates the protocol, of course, right? Sure. Exactly, yeah, certainly. Yeah. So those are all optimizations, right? You, you could potentially predict these things again. So if you get it exclusive, you don't need to inform the directory, right? I don't know what you are talking about over there, but I, th I think the uh, example was if, if two processors are actually keep on writing, right? And the directory is somehow getting write requests. Exactly. But, but then if, if it keeps getting a read exclusive request or write request from someone else, uh, what I think what he, was, uh, what he is alluding to is... What if this keeps happening all the time, like in a ping-ponging manner? Maybe you, you wait for giving the block to this other processor. You give this processor for some time, I don't know, for a minute, let's say. And then you give it to the other processor for another minute. So that's a fairness issue, basically, depending on the access pattern. As opposed to switching between the processors all the time, you give some time, yeah. Well, again, that's an implementation decision also, right? Like, how do you decide? Uh, so that, these are all implementation decisions in the protocol. But in the basic vanilla protocol that I said, the, when, the, uh, when the directory says, oh, I want this block, the CPU gives up the exclusive access, right? But you can have many, many issues related to this, certainly. OK. Well, I think it, uh, there, there are issues here. There's a performance issue and there's a correctness issue, right? First of all, getting it correct is the first step. And what I described here is correct. But performance, now, if you try to optimize for performance, sure, there are many, many issues. And we have not started that. That's, <laughs> that's part of what we're going to discuss. I guess we'll start with this tomorrow, and we'll finish it, and then we'll see what review we can do. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thanks.